<laughs> you stopped it early. Hey, what's up? What happened to the intro? Can we I don't know. I don't know who's in the booth tonight. Things are going weird already. We planned out this huge, great intro, and boom. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We have uh, Matt Bush. He'll be on in just a second. T and I just wanted to touch base. Uh, we T and I hit a lot of things over the tour, and we are going to get into some of that with Matt. We're going to have some of these questions from fans. we got a bunch of great questions, and um, we're going to have uh, some fun stories, too, there. How are you doing tonight, T? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. This is very exciting. I think uh, we're all looking forward to hearing from Matt. It's going to be fun. I think we have some great questions. I know you and I have a couple things, bets and debates to settle mm -hmm. with him. So we'll see, get some definitive answers finally from the man himself and uh, hear what he has to say. It's going to be fun. Yeah, so why don't, why don't you bring him in there, Mr. Producer, man? There he hey. is. Hey. hey, how are we doing tonight? Good to see you guys again. Right. Had, you had, had a few days off there to get your head together after tour, I guess. Uh, off, we're not quite off yet, but we're home. Right. I, so I, I think Yankees, I, you got to see a Yankees game. I did hit a Yankees game in Anaheim on my way home with my brother. That was that was great. Oh, and, nice. Uh, um, they got it killed. Didn't help them much. Though, huh? Angels. No. The best thing to happen to the Angels were playing the Yankees all of a sudden. Like. Seemed to be. Seemed to be. But, uh, if in case anyone doesn't know, the Orioles are in sole possession of first place. Wow, I even I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, they they beat the Dodgers the other night uh, yeah. to take wow. over first. And the Rays place. lost, right. right? And the Rays lost. Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. So so why don't we? Um, there's a lot of new people watching. Haven't seen you that you've been on a few times before. Why don't we get into exactly what you do for Dead and Company and Bob Weir? <clears throat> uh, I'm Bobby's personal manager. Um, we, you know, we have a team, so there's a, a lot of us that are Bobby managers, but uh, I'm, I've been with him the longest out of anyone on our team, 18 years. I started out as his tour manager, um, 2005 Rat Dog, um, and became his only manager late 2008, and then we brought on the rest of the team after fairly well. Um, and uh, I also have started with the uh, well, the first one I ever did was the Dead 2009, July 4th. That was the first set list I ever wrote. Uh, but with further, it started to become a regular thing where uh, Jalesh and I would take turns every other show writing the further set lists. Um, and then that carried over post further with Rat Dog in 2014. Bobby had me write them all. And then uh, with Dead and Company, I, you know, I really never assumed that that's going to be how things work with any of the projects when Bobby puts together a new project. Uh, but shortly into Dead Co's rehearsals, I started writing all, all their set lists as well. Very nice. And then once you write a set list, what, you throw it out to the band, everybody good with this kind of thing? Um, yeah, basically. You know, and, and, and I usually send to Bobby and John first because they're the singers and, you know, certain, um, you know, certain segues or certain combos may not work you know, for them vocally, uh, also as the guitar players, like I've put arrows on things and John's like, wait, I got to switch guitars here or, or Bobby mentions that. And, you know, so then, you know, so it helps them to see it first and then it usually goes to the rest of the band from there. Um, and How then, far in know, advance do they usually, do you usually, do they usually see it? I sit, you know, um, usually the day before is when I start the sending it around process. Sometimes it's the morning of, like if we're doing three in a row, it depends on how that show ends and how tired or, you know, you know, what, you know, I, I don't want to send a set list at 2 a.m. if people are first going to bed, you know, because I don't want that, you know, sitting in their minds all night. So I may wait till the morning on a show like that. When we when we were doing this tour, which I didn't do this every tour, but this tour, the three night runs, I wrote all three together um, and the same with a couple of the two night runs. And then I would send those. To Bobby and John at the same time. That way they could sort of see the picture for the, the whole run. Um, and uh, um, it did the same way with San Francisco. But then each morning of each subsequent show, I'd resend what we had and make sure it's still good, still what they're looking for. Um, if anything that happened at the previous show. Um, and how much how much leeway do they have during the show to kind of, I know sometimes like there was that Black Peter that Bobby kind of played. How much leeway do they have to 
not necessarily change it, but maybe play a different song or two in in the show or change it. <laughs> yeah, I like to say no set list is confirmed until they've actually played it. Um, okay. it's, it's a living, breathing document. To you me. always have it tape ready, right? <laughs> it sometimes changes on the first Bob and John send out. Then sometimes it changes after it gets to the rest of the band. Then sometimes it changes at sound check. Sometimes it changes between sound check and set one. Sometimes set one could create a real time change. Either Bobby does an audible or like in the case of night one, uh, the loser. I think the gorge, uh, was it night one gorge that they were surprisingly with the s- uh, no, actually, it was Boulder. Night one, Boulder. Surprisingly, a set that was closing with Terrapin Station, a set one, they were coming up short on time, and I needed them to add one, and so it was a spontaneous add. But uh, wasn't there. Loser Bobby's call? Bobby was. Uh, fa- it's a fascinating story about Loser. Um, loser was the first song that I it was the top song I couldn't get into San Francisco. I basically, after I'd written it all, there was one sort of slow song first set slot and I had no O'Teal lead vocals on one of his ballads the whole run and I couldn't do three San Francisco without giving O'Teal a song. And I, you know, I, I had hit him up in advance, you know, what do you want for this last slot? And he chose high time. Um, and I was like, I, if I put on paper loser high time, I know exactly who in the band is going to come at me for t- two slow songs in a row. So I can't do that. I can't put that on paper. Um, maybe it was, I hadn't consciously thought it, but in the back of my mind, Bobby can audible into whatever he wants and that's fine. And that'll always go over well. And obviously it, it, I talked to him about it during separate that night that like just showing we're still on the same wavelength because the one song I just couldn't get into San Francisco that I really wanted to was loser. And then he just made it happen. The only way it could have happened in that slot was for him to just segue right into it as an audible and then do high time next anyway. And, you know, so that's, that's great. And that's I, so I was so cool. thrilled he did it because you know, we got one more loser that I really thought we, we should have had in there. Um, and how much do you pay attention to if they change the set list, like especially during the show? And the, does that affect the next night set list or anything like that? It, it can, because often uh, uh, often is the case they audible into something. I've got queued up for the next night, um, <laughs> you know, because, again, you know, so similar wavelengths and all that. Uh, but there's the last show tour, so it didn't matter. The only the only it didn't matter at all because I had made it quite clear to anyone with an earshot of me all weekend that I have played these curfew games all summer long. And on the last night of the tour, they're going to make this band cut a song over my dead body. It's just not happening. And I don't care what, you know, like whatever the right. consequences are, we'll deal with them. Um, right. You know, it was a neighborhood issue because uh, they haven't done a concert there on a Sunday night since long before a new residential apartment buildings were up behind the stadium. So they were definitely concerned about noise, but I, my understanding was there wasn't really a law or an ordinance or a fine or anything tied to the just we don't want to piss off the neighbors. So right. nights one and two, I played the game very politely. And night three, technically a six o'clock ticket, it was a 10 o'clock curfew and we ended at 1035. Right. I wondered about that because um, it was earlier. But with yeah. the drones and with everything going on, it was kind of like, ah, if you go late, what are you going to do? It's the last night, you know. It, it reminds it, That's me how of... I looked at it. I, I yeah. you know, I cut two encores this tour and I wasn't happy about either of them. Mm-hmm. I had to do it, but uh, uh, it wasn't happening in, on the last show. Tour. They, um, it reminds me of Merriweather. Merriweather has been there since 68 or 69 and they built yeah. all those houses around it and all those people complain about Merriweather. Well, Merriweather was there all by its lonesome forever. You know? Yeah, exactly. Well, that all these sheds, that's one of the problems with curfews in a lot of these in a lot of these cities right now is all of these sheds were built in the middle of nowhere. And now they're all resident. Now they're the suburbs and residential neighborhoods where people live. And so these, um, you know, the time starts to matter a little bit more. The curfew starts to matter a little bit more because sometimes, you know, it's just county law. They will pull the plug on you. You know, like Atlanta was definitely a pull the plug scenario. And I hated cutting that that encore out of there. And what was that the night, encore? Um, I th- it was either knocking on the weight that night, maybe. Okay. I can't remember. Touch and break got cut touch once. I one think. Night, didn't yeah, you? touch got cut once. I thought. Um, and that's so and interesting so, uh, that even you ran out of time because I mean you guys were really, really good about coming on on time for the most part and really playing to, to time a lot of the times. It just sort of second sense or whatever it goes was to their, a little bit long, it, and then it goes to them loving it that they were just into it. You know, they yeah, weren't really into it this summer, yeah. and uh, time was an issue because you know we have a late arriving audience. Shakedown's a lot of fun. Also, obviously, as we saw in Pittsburgh and, and Bristow and some other places, the parking situation at these sheds were brutal. And uh, um, but you know we 
uh, Live Nation did step up a little bit in some of those Midwest sheds where I don't know if it was noticed, but we started maybe 20, 30 minutes later and we're allowed to go to 11, 15, 11, 20. And they dealt with the costs on that, you know, and, and it was great of them to do that. Um, but some venues, it doesn't matter. Even if they control the venue, they, there's a county ordinance. We're pulling the plug at 1101, no matter how late you, you know, we don't care that you're holding for the sake of traffic. You're just doing I a short like show. And, and, and it's it's a kind of a game of chicken. I, I, I want the band to play. There are people worried about safety. Deer Creek 95 is always fresh in people's minds. Mm -hmm. There was actually an incident in San Francisco. 150 people broke down a, a small gate on the, on the third base line and, and snuck in night two. Well, that's um, what I was going to say is I always feel like, too, if they'd open the venue sometimes a half an hour even earlier, because a lot of times the lines, especially at the baseball stadiums, yeah. like Dodger Stadium was like last year was a pain getting in. Sometimes yep. getting in is the issue. And it's like, well, why don't they just open the gates a little bit earlier so we can get everybody in a little bit earlier? Well, well unfortunately, that's a production schedule issue most of the time. We what we, we did that day, any stadium day where we did two, three shows and only sound check day one gates open earlier days two and three. But on a load in day. You know, we already have guys loading in 6, 7 a.m. or sometimes stadium stages being built the day before. We, right. They're just not ready for us to sound check until that 30, 45 minutes before doors. And then that's all the time we have. And if we want to do something cool or different, well, we have to figure it out in 30, 45 minutes. Because then if we don't open doors on time, then we're the cause of the problem. And right. So we don't want to do that. We want to get them in early. That's great. Um, yeah. Other times we were ready to open early and they had no staffing and just couldn't do it. Thanks, um, Slappy. And, and, and those are, you know, because... You know, if they're going to get 200 parking attendants, ushers, ticket takers to come in an hour early, they got to message that a couple of days in advance. They just can't do it that morning. Oh, the band's going to be done sound early. Everyone <laughs> get in, you right. Know, yeah. Hey, show up early for work today because we're going to open a little <laughs> you, earlier. You know, yeah. Fish, yeah. they don't care. They sound check and everybody, every night you hear what the sound check yeah. is. And oh, oh, we, we know they hear our through. sound check too, but we, we're not going to let people into the stadium. Right, the venue right. itself, right? right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so, I mean, so, sometimes Bobby's still working on his rig and he'll let doors open even if he's just standing up there messing around with stuff. Um, right. So he'll help us out that way where it's not like we need a clean stage to open doors, but yeah. um, what, at least. What is, your over, what is your overall impression of the tour? I thought it was the best tour they've ever played. I think so. um, it was fantastic. Um, uh, you know, I, the chemistry was unbelievable. Um, you know, a good thing to check out actually is John's uh, separate interview from, I think, Friday night, San Francisco mm -hmm. on, on Nugs, because he really talked about the seamless segues and some of that and he, really insightful with um, with how that was happening and how, how um, you know, and how they've grown in that way, how they, you know, how, how he also pointed out how Bobby's hand signals of various other cues were so overt and deliberate on the first couple of tours and then how much smaller and more subtler they'd become because you know the, the sort of group mind thing had really had really taken on um it, it seemed it really seemed to t and i i'm going to speak for t here watching that it was the mayor Kimenti show a lot of it they seemed to just have this thing that bubbled over i don't know locked in together it really yeah. seemed like they really kind of had this bond going from 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 night one even from new orleans in fact like you could see it from the beginning and it just sort of grew over tour and you know you being as close as you are and seeing as much as you see yeah. and being such a part of it what what would you attribute this this tour being so much the best tour what what do you think it was um i think it's several things i think I think the pressure came off with the last tour announcement. I think it just became a lot more about having fun. The camaraderie sort of came back. The band was hanging out again on days off. And even before the show, like, you know, before the show, usually it's, it's John comes on from his corner. Mickey and O'Teal come on from stage left. Bobby, Jeff from stage right. Now they were all coming to stage right at one point first, hanging out for a bit. Then, you know, then they still sort of got to go back to the corners before they hit, you know, get ears and things like that. But there was there was already these sort of moments of camaraderie before the show would start that that hadn't been happening in years past. Um, and, you know, everyone just no one was mourning. Everyone really was of the mind. We we're going to have as much fun as possible. Um, you know, it wasn't necessarily spoken, but I remember when we were putting together fairly well and Shapiro and I were discussing the venues and the first time we brought Soldier Field up. Uh, to some of the other band guys, um, you know, they mentioned, well, why would we want to play there again? It was so awful in 95. I was like, well, that's the reason. End with a better memory. And, you know, the 95 Grateful Dead tour was called the tour from hell. And, you know, I think it's it's nice that now there's a last tour that has a much better memory attached to it. Um, that's very true. And I think to your point, you could see Mayer 
really enjoying himself a lot like the dancing moves and kind of like he looked a lot yep. more relaxed and a lot more fun on stage and like kev just said him and Kamente with that bond that they have and then i think it's really interesting the closeness part that you brought up i think that really came through in the music in them like bonding like that and kind of hanging out together and not coming on separately you know kind of having yep. those moments together definitely came through in the music that's fascinating yeah that's really uh, yeah i think all that really tied together um it's really cool so <clears throat> let's get into t and i's oh battles uh, we wait, hold on hold on i have one question yeah. jump in llama okay so how do you think overall the tour did for bringing the dead and its music to a younger generation oh i think this i mean we've noticed it in years past the especially in, in outdoor sheds how young the lawn often looks um and this tour definitely became about generational trips to see the dead grandparents bringing kids bringing grandkids and, and you know we saw probably more full families than i'm used to seeing you know in, inside the show and um you know i, I definitely think, think it did that and I, I yeah i think there's a whole new slew of people under 20 under you know teenagers all that that are now like wow i gotta see more of this how am i gonna do that kind of kind of thing and i, I think kevin and i commented more than a few times about how many kids we would see either on the rail or down on the floor with their parents or in the crowd like with the camera shots and it was really young kids you know not necessarily seven babies, year old but... singing mr charlie i was yeah, like and, and some of them knew the lyrics and that was the other thing they knew the lyrics so they were obviously yeah. you know and that's really cool that's quite a memory for them you know yeah it's, awesome. it's, it's amazing and, and you know, we've, we've definitely felt that um it's fantastic cool. all right so t and i have gone back and forth about two things maybe more but this one really has been stuck with me the other one they play it on a tuesday night they finish it on a wednesday night is that one or two performances of the other one interesting if it's on a different night i guess technically it's two if it's other one one and two in the same show it's just one um though i know i just label it other one or other one one and two like that um you know playing reprise is listed as a reprise because that's what bobby calls it this was our next you know? question because okay. what, what, i often just throw playing on there and don't think about i usually i often don't set list the reprise and just sort of let them you know and, and that's what would happen is is at some point in space or somewhere or somewhere like, we got we got to finish playing or we got to do the reprise we gotta you know and then it'll come up or or if i throw it on playing well, on night well, one of a multi-night run and and haven't sent the other nights probably be like we'll do the reprise night three or night yeah i'll throw it on night three and, when, when you're you um know. 16 17 year old and you get some tapes and you're writing set list did you ever write reprise for playing unless it was a complete another night or something i did if it was in the encore probably if, did. Like, they played it in the second set and then it was an encore yeah. i always had the reprise in there so i the never encore. did it was I mean, playing and playing yeah I know, it's interesting know. that that right playing comes with the reprise and Uncle John's necessarily doesn't, uh, you know, right. we've broken that one up. Um, though, though with his symphony show, we have a, it's a, called the reprise, but it's transcripted out as the end of play and the end of Uncle John's and the end of Dark Star. Actually, I think it goes Dark Star, Uncle John's playing. Um, but it's just called the reprise and it's those ending parts of all three. All it's verse to a Dark Star and then all three. Um, and see, oh, I always wrote yeah. reprise too, and I always considered it a reprise. And then I brought it up to Kevin. We were talking about it, and he made a good point because I was like, you know, playing to me is like tweezer to me. Like it's it's the one song that really has a lot of space to jam and one of the best sort of jam uh -huh. jams that they can get into. Yeah, cool. And then yeah. they'll bring it back in the encore. And I was like, that feels like a tweezer reprise. And Kevin's like, yeah, but tweezer reprise is its own kind of song. It has a different start up and into it and play and just kind of picks back up where playing sort of left off and goes into it so i can see why some people wouldn't necessarily call it a reprise but yeah i've always called it a reprise i always i, I always have it. and that's what bobby calls it so that's another so there you go and I, always, I, always argue, <laughs> I always argue with cows like it says it on the set list and if matt's writing it as a reprise i'm calling it a reprise so. yeah <laughs> it doesn't have any rhyme or reason but that's okay mm -hmm. i like it so like so it. who knew that john mayer was such an incredible blues guitarist because i didn't know I mean, Bobby and I, I mean, yeah, <laughs> he's I mean, been on my radar for this music for a long time. Right, uh, it right. just never really worked out. I mean, he, his trio, I was working for Phil Lesh in 05, New Year's run, and his trio opened three of those shows. And that was, you know, that was just him and Pino and Steve Jordan. That, that was a big time blues trio. Um, and uh, we reached out to him during the further years, but didn't get anywhere with it. Um, and then obviously everyone knows the story when he reached out about getting Bobby on the late, late show. Right. So he was on your radar. 
Yeah. That's interesting. I, when I worked for the Almond Brothers back uh, in the early 2000s, Derek Trucks was on Columbia, and the Columbia rep that used to come to the shows would bring us box sets at the end of every run of just Columbia releases and, you know, some great jazz stuff, some, you know, some Springsteen and Dylan in the mix. But I remember checking out the brand new guy named John Mayer and, and I kind of like some of the pop songs. Uh, it, you know, at that time, I wasn't thinking about him as Grateful Dead guy, but I wasn't um, fully in Grateful Dead camp yet then either. Um, but uh, he's just that good, you know, and he can sing and, and you know, and, and I, I think, and Kevin and I talked about it a lot too on the after shows a lot of the times was the slower songs and those bluesier songs. He really, I mean, he just dominated them. He took them to places yeah. and was able to some some of those slower jams and some of those builds. But man, whenever you had the blues song in that first set, I felt it like that was... Too. I wish I could do Big Boss Man more. He, he, you only he had really one, on I once. think. I know, and, yeah. and I put it on a couple more times, but he, he swapped it for like, next time you see me once and I think it hurts me too the other time for another hurts me too. He does Elmore James as good as Elmore James. Oh yeah. It's it's unbelievable. Oh, yeah. And I always felt like those were the moments in the first set that really cat like were the catalysts in the first set to start sort of getting them yeah. to a place of like, okay, now the yep. show's really we've warmed up. We're like ready to go. Yep. I mean, well, I think we Hurts Me Too was the... was debuted we at Wrigley calling... a few years back. And I remember we sound checked it the day before we debuted it, and it was the single it's the one song that got sound checked that they hadn't done yet that blew up my phone more than any other that when's this coming? Well, I heard this outside. When's this coming? And, and that kind of thing, you know, even, even more than when they debuted the 11 or stuff like that, even. Right. We That's were great. calling it the, uh, the smoky bar didn't come to you like you could just picture them in some <laughs> uh, dive bar you know playing it it always yeah, made yeah. me feel like like you, you it was amazing because you'd be like at Folsom or this giant stadium and all of a sudden you'd feel like oh my god I feel like we're in Chicago in a smoky blues bar and it's just like Jeff and Jay and John playing some kind of blues song and it was just it would get so intimate it was beautiful and then yep. explode back out into a into a full show it was just it was awesome yep mm -hmm. so let's do the openers and closers um we uh, t and i kept talking about oh sugar reopened in the second set and you reached out to me and said something you want to explain your thinking behind those kind of moves so as i'm sure people if you look at the set list can see uh, i don't have a whole lot of second set songs john mayer sings and though very early on in this band and multiple times after that because i you know uh, even because i kind of disagreed with them john would come to me and go i don't really care about the singing part of it like you don't have to write sets finding ways to include me if a set needs to kick ass and i don't sing a song in it that's fine with him uh i say i disagree i think you need to at least have one full lead song in each set i think people are coming to see that want to hear you sing these songs and, and i'm mm -hmm. going to just have to get creative about getting you certain songs in the second set now in my mind in, in years past he had turned althea into a set two song last year i even had brown eyed women in a couple of set two you know first or second song slots because that song was just such fire um, last year MVP. this year MVP. too really yeah. um but you see you know i, I moved cumberland into set two he doesn't sing it fully but he takes a you know the last verse on it um you know that became a set two song a couple of years ago um so i sugary um when i when we went back to the the 73 style upbeat, they love each other. That fit well in that slot. I love another MVP deal in that this slot. year. Mike. Like, yeah. he, he, he kind of put deal, you know, he sort of allowed me to put deal anywhere. I think I put deal out of space once a year or two ago. Um, and, uh, but I had it open set two or second song set two. I had, I've had it open shows. I've had a close set ones, of course, where it's traditionally ends up. Um, so yes, yeah, so that was sort of my, uh, um, you know how how I got him songs to sing in set two. Now I see, see someone asked about Box of Rain. That used to be I would put that as a set two opener, but uh, John struggled with that song and kind of asked off of it after a while. Um, right. So that's why that one kind of. Are there any songs that are rest, specifically? Any songs specifically set one set two that in your head it's always going to be a set one song? I mean, most of the rest that you've seen in set one, you know. Um, I never thought about opening a set two with Good Times Roll. I've, I've, I may have put, I've done, I think I've opened set two with Birth of Good Lovin', um, for sure. Um, and I like to move Shake Down around a little bit. Um, this tour. But, uh, oh, thank you, Katie Buck. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, most, you know, so I, 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 I think maybe once I open a set two with Half Step, but that's a first set song to me. Um, you know, I, I I, I did bucket out of space a couple of times and it worked phenomenally, but I kind of like just doing that once and, and just letting it be a treat. 
kind of I did thing. like the way you moved some of those um, songs around. Like Telio, yeah. I think, to Kev's point, like really kind of this, it was one of those MVP songs and wherever it fell on the set, it yeah, it, it, it like had that feeling and like really they took it places. So it was interesting to see. How what, did, and I brought up him doing, he'd done it once with Billy, I think in 21, where it was sort of spontaneous. I think he had told Billy he wanted to do it that way in advance, but not the rest of the band and just kind of did it the first time and then hadn't done it again. And I brought, I think it was SPAC where it first came back and I brought it to go, hey, can we, if I put it at the top of set two, can it be the, the 73 style? And he loved the idea and went for it and, and crushed it. I mean, that, that first one at SPAC was probably and the, the extra lyric. Um, the extra and the lyric, extra extra lyric. lyric. Yeah. yeah. Well, going back to the 73 version, like it just, exactly. it was smoking. I loved it. Like that's my favorite version and it's one of my favorite tunes like i played it at my wedding and like it's engraved in my wedding ring and like all this yeah. stuff i love it and so like hearing it come back like that and the way they played this tour i was in heaven with it, it was awesome well we got we got into a bit of uh the right song to open the first set and bucket came up with the slow jazz intro that it kind of it wasn't a rocker it didn't come out and right. smack you in the face and right. sometimes that it, it seemed like it i don't know it, it was harder to get into the set and, but by halfway through, you were okay. Yeah, uh, and and that's I feel like trucking come. I'm um, sorry, a bucket coming out of space. Space became that jazzy intro, and then it just kind of slammed in into the song and worked really well. Which right, yeah. is funny because because John had asked a couple of times about Bobby starting trucking that way, and it never happened until the very last night, the encore, the very last version of trucking, and he just crashed into the tune and lyrics without the slow jazzy intro. <laughs> and how do you decide usually what's coming out of space in some of those songs because some nights you know um like kevin and i would talk about when you put days between their work perfectly but then other nights you'd put something that actually was like a ripper coming out of space and you'd be like oh this worked perfectly too and it was just sort of like one of those how do you usually feel how do you weigh that days between to me i it's i love it so so i don't want to, this next sentence to sound like a critique um but it's the longest slowest ballad Mm -hmm. And so I feel like it works better coming out of space because then you can just rock after. And then the second reason, which actually got flipped around on me at Bristow, um, oftentimes Jeff does a piano solo intro um, before Days Between. That's that's gorgeous. And at Bristow, I had brought up, hey, do you want to we have time on the clock? Do you want to take a little piano solo before Days? I brought that up to both him and Bob. And they both kind of started, uh, flipped it the other way. Like, how about milestones instead? I was like, well, I'm never going to say that's a bad idea. I love the <laughs> jazz. In fact, if I was trying to do reverse psychology, I would have phrased the question the same way and got them to milestones right. that way. And then, it, you know, I didn't know, but milestones in the same key as days between. And so that made that easy. And so then if then in my mind, okay, if I just put days between out of space, I probably get milestones too. And that did happen, I think, at least one or two more times. Um and then the last night I brought up, hey, you know, milestones before days between again. And they collectively know we just want to play along with the drones. So it didn't happen. I was going to ask what, they what was the inspiration for playing they milestones. Just, they just kind yeah. of wanted to play. Um, yeah, well, I mean, we love the jazz cool. stuff. The jazz stuff started with Coltrane stuff back in 2016, maybe. Um, and uh, um at least with this band and and actually the the they've done a love supreme i think in bristow actually again mm -hmm. yeah um and then i didn't know if that was a fluke or not but uh, uh my dad was uh it still is a volunteer for the coltrane home foundation which is the house mm -hmm. he wrote a love supreme album in on long island right. and restoring it into a museum and uh my dad had run the jeff Kimenti and catering i think it's city field 2016 and then this happened again in MSG 2017, and they started talking Coltrane. And my and Jeff, without me even knowing or being around, told my dad, "We're going to do a Coltrane for you tonight." And then that's the Love Supreme came out of space for that. So none of it was it wasn't rehearsed or anything. No, beforehand. none of the jazz has ever been rehearsed. All blues. They just fell into it that time. Um, so cool. All the jazz they did. You know, my favorite things a couple of times. Love Supreme a few times. Milestones. All of it just kind of happened, and they never rehearsed it. And the same thing goes for the the Dark Star on the Big River Jam and that whole thing. That was never rehearsed, only talked. Wow. About, um, which right. was kind of the coolest. That was one of my favorite things all summer long. Totally. Um, totally. And that jam really became something. I mean, it became something you, you Kevin and I would talk about, too, and be like, I don't know where this came from, but it is fucking awesome like when they fall into those things. And those spontaneous yeah. jams are really um, beautiful. Yeah, well, as, as John said also on that 
same interview the, the Friday night, San Francisco. It was a Bobby idea, but but that's the short, very short answer. Um, you know, he always, you know, I, I have to make sure I'm stage right during drums because that's when he comes off and that's another reassess the set moment, both, you know, A, if there's running out of time, we need to cut something or rewrite it or, you know, or just how things are feeling. Maybe they want something different. Um, or if there's extra time, that's when I try to talk Jeff into anything. <laughs> um, you know, second, uh, second to last show, I talked him into the Blues for Allah uh, teaser because it was the only thing he hadn't touched on all summer long. They'd done Spanish jams, they'd done jazz. The only thing they hadn't done, which he'd done once the last couple of years, was a little playing around with the Arabian Nights lick and um, and that sort of blues for Allah line. Um, and uh, Bobby looked at the set, what was left, and I had other one set the second part of the other one coming out of space. And he said, I don't want to do that. I'll kick that to tomorrow night. Uh, let's do something else. I'm like, well, what do you got in mind? And he's like, ah, eh, let's just we'll be in the key of whatever. Let's just jam around there and see what happens. And then he's like, I see what John, John wants to do. All right. I run over to John said, Hey, this is, and then John started to think goes, I'd rather do a song than just, you know, that. And he's like, what if we do a cowboy tune out of space? I'm like, all right, I like where this is going. Let's, what can it be? And I'm like, it's not El Paso. It's not me and my uncle. That's too first seti. I think we just on mama tried the day before. And then like at the same time, like how about big river? Like, boom. Okay. I'll go back. To Bobby and, and see if he wants to sing Big River. Um, so I get back to Bobby and he's like, that's a great idea, but I'm not singing it. I'm like, well, we need to animate this. We I, need that. This I'm like, okay. Right. I, 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 I'm, I'm picturing right. myself also running around like a chicken without a head doing all this while drums is happening and the clock's ticking and I've only got X amount of time to work it out. Um, so I'm like, okay, great. That's what we'll do. I was like, now what am I going to do with this? I'm not going to go back and explain this, t I can't explain it to the drummers, they're drumming and O'Teal too. They're, you know, so I'm just going to go to the teleprompter guy. I'm going to tell him to queue up Big River. I'm going to tell John we're good. And then I'm just going to see what happens. Like, I, I can't, I'm going to run out of time to have more debate. So fuck it. I'm just going to say it's Big River and whatever happens, happens. By the time I come back from stage left, Bobby, John, and O.T. And, and Jeff are standing there talking. And as I get there, I think it's Jeff. I'm like, did something change again? And Jeff's like, we're going to play Dark Star and Big River at the same time, and it's going to be great. Like, okay. <laughs> so that I can just leave awesome. Big River as the queued up thing on the prompter. Like, does anyone need anything else? Like, that'll be fine. He's not singing it anyway. This is going to now, be great. Now, how and, did you uh, decide what to call that on the set list? Well, I listened to it first while they were playing it. And and sure enough, they're playing Big River. And, yeah, some people thought it was Cumberland, but it was it was Big River. And he just started playing the you know, they just started playing the Dark Star licks over the Big River. They didn't sing it. And so it just hit me. I'm like, this sounds like a Dark Star is on the Big River because they're playing Dark Star on top of a Big River. And I just wrote Dark Star on the Big River, Jim. There it is. Um, and then... How did it pop up again? And then uh, after that, I'm like, you know, we did the next show in Boston. The other one, too, came back. And then as we went on to Deer Creek, I'm like, you know, I've got river and water in my mind again. I'll never forget the... 2002 Phil and Friends show where we lost Jimmy Herring and we found him by the little lake up in Deer Creek parking lot with a fishing pole <laughs> sitting there open for the best. Um, and I was like, so I got that in my mind, I'm like big river. We might as well do it in Deer Creek. Like, like we, you know, we've been, the world needs a big river at this point. It's just due. And then during sound check, Jeff brings up, well, Hey, can we finish dark star in big river? Cause we never did dark star verse two in Boston. We only did that jam thing. And Bobby goes, that's great, but we're not running it. We're just doing it. <laughs> it's like, all right, cool. And then they talked down how they would do it and then did it a completely different way in real time. <laughs> Originally, I, I think it. during John's last solo is when they would start playing Dark Star over it. And then Bobby would start singing Dark Star over his solo in Big River. Instead, they played the whole song all the way through. I remember standing stage right going, oh, fuck, they're not doing it. And then Bobby sort of did this motion. And next thing I know, he's singing Dark Star. And I'm like, oh, and yeah, and it just blew all our minds. I um, mean, the collaboration there alone is so cool to hear about. And just like their creativity and, and you coming back and Jeff being like, okay, we're going to do it, but we're going to do it like this and it's going to be great. I mean, that is, that's fascinating and so awesome and just tells you how, how great they are to be able to just do that and, and come out with this fantastic piece of music. Yeah. yeah, that's, 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 it's confidence, you know, and, and it's, and, you know, look, 
Jay Lane's played more shows with Bobby the last 25 years than any, any other drummer. And, and, you know, that's just the reality of the side projects and things like that. I mean, and he Jeff. Is so, and not only that, and Jeff too, but not only that, Jay's been around enough of these where he knows how to make Bobby happy and the guy in the band who wants kind of a little bit the opposite of what Bobby wants. He knows how to, you know, you know, he was around the first year further. Like he, you know, he's knew what he had to do to make both Bobby and Phil happy, who sometimes wanted different things at the same time. And so he he knows how to do that already. And uh, and you can't understate you know. how important that position is, is to be able to please two people at once, especially in that position. Yeah. I mean, that's. Yeah. yeah. But also, you know, when O'Teal sings, he needs to be there for O'Teal and what O'Teal. Oh, completely. Yeah. And it, it's it's yeah. it's all there. Um, um to, to, I saw one comment about Cream Puff War. This band never sounds like mm. Cream Puff War. That's yep. a different band. <laughs> um, <laughs> Further did Cream Puff War. Uh, did uh, fairly well. We did Cream Puff War, but it hasn't done right. been done since. Uh, so just, there are a couple of things I got sound checked and never happened, unfortunately, but that's just how it goes. I sound checked. I used to love her, but it's all over now in the gorge in San Francisco. But it, it uh, didn't show. It didn't show, but in a way it was good because uh, uh, I mean, I would have liked to hear it and it still would have kind of fit the narrative. Like night one, I don't know who noticed or didn't, but I had written, you know, our love will not fade away to open. And then every song, the rest of that show was a song Jerry sang lead on before the knocking on heaven's door encore which he also sang lead on but we had pre-planned the knocking on heaven's door slide tribute show for all the right. past grateful deads you know weeks ago um and you had and a that's the only of- reason why that ended up there so quickly i never would have done it as soon after the gorge with dave matthews in fact i kind of wanted the songs i knew not fade away was coming back but i wanted the songs dave did to be the last versions of those songs and just leave them there uh, but i already knew knocking was coming back uh, for night one and then originally bobby was going to slide used to love her into that first set um which would have sort of ended that little theme other than in my mind okay you know her is the band dead and company and bobby's saying he loves the band but now it's over and you know so it it sort of fits these shows in a way uh if you stretch a little bit oh the heads uh, would have just ate it up the heads um, yeah. but he opted out of it right i mean he opted out of it 10 minutes before i called house lights one more stage <laughs> right he's like I, I can i think i want something else there and then like i had had a different jerry tune there originally but because sam cutler had just passed i was looking for a way to cram speedway on the this show too i already had he's gone and knocking and, and him in the slideshow but speedway was sort of the perfect uh addition for sam cutler and so it yeah. it all sort of worked itself out they um uh somebody uh had asked about well real quick i want to I wanted to ask him because he touched on it. What was what brought Dave? What was the Dave? What what was the inspir like what what brought Dave in? That's like was the going, only one yeah. the happened? only one that was a guest of any show and whatever. And what how did that come about? And to your point, like making that, well, Russo, that watch tower the last one. Kevin and I Russo talked a lot about drums. About Russo came that. out for drums in New York and, and uh did we have another drummer at some point along the way? Mexico, you had goose guys. Oh, we had the goose yeah. guys and Isaac Eddy in Mexico. Um, but I meant as far as like a real like Dave came out and sang. Yeah, and, like, no, Dave, yeah. so uh, that actually, little... believe it or not, uh, Derek Featherstone, our, our tour director and, and front of house engineer, uh, does similar work with Dave, has worked with Dave a long time. And you know, we've always talked about how, uh, you know, when we got back to Folsom Field, the last show before us at Folsom Field had been Dave Matthews' band, and that was why they didn't do shows again. And Bobby had just yeah. done that, uh, done a, that thing at Brooklyn Bowl with Dave in January. It was a, it was sort of a private, but they had a really good time together and had been talking a little bit and looking for a way to sort of reconnect. And uh, um, so we just sort of took the chance on it. We're like this sounds like a cool idea. Let's just see if he's up for it. I mean, he wasn't anywhere near us. He'd have to you know make an effort and get all the way out. Um, and uh, so he went for it. And uh, you know. And then uh, he he wanted to do, he actually chose The Wait and Knockin' as two songs he wanted to do. And I chose The Watchtower and Not Fade Away. Uh, Which but I suggested to the guys, can they learn it? Would you guys learn the first verse his way? And then once it kicks in, you can just do straight Watchtower. You don't have to do, you know, all the crazy hits he, he normally does with that. Um, but Jay Lane really got, I mean, he got a, like, he, he listened to that thing. He wanted to nail every Carter Beaufort part. He was so feeling it and into it and he actually that did so even awesome. as the song kicked in and parts that you know normally with dave matthews band would go da, 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 like all those hits jay was still doing them even though dave was wasn't even doing them most of the time i think when jay, dave realized he had jay doing it he he joined a couple of them but like no one wanted to make it that complicated for the guys but jay just right. took it on and 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 you know he 
I remember standing with John's tour manager, who, who's big Dave Matthews fan. During all that, we were just looking at each other like, holy fuck. <laughs> I guess Jay's auditioning to, to cover for Carter someday, too, if he needs to. <laughs> I mean, it was so good. And Kevin and I talked about that. And it was such a good, it's a different version, right? The way he plays it is so unique and different. And the fact that you guys incorporated that into the Dead Show was so brilliant yeah. and so cool. And like that, it just worked so well. Yeah. It's fantastic. All right, why don't we uh, take why don't we take a second here and let me say like, subscribe. Uh, you can become a fan. Ring the bell. We are here every night after fish shows doing the after fish after show, aptly titled. And uh, on August third, we're going to have Tapers Choice with T and Llama doing an interview with a couple of the guys. They have Choice Fest coming up, so make sure that you uh, keep your eyes out for that. And beyond that, thank you, T Ware. Um, Let's jump back into it with some fan stuff here because yeah. I know a lot of these people are like, we need answers. So Bring top of the list, <laughs> you, you saw this earlier when we were trying to figure out banners, which we aren't going to have now. Um, why were Dark Star 11 and St. Stephen lacking from the closing shows in San Francisco? Um, well, I mean, I guess the question is what would what might have been pulled out to fit those in. Um, but uh, I was, you know, a lot of people... I think did the Gorge and San Francisco. I think a lot mm -hmm. of people did last five. I think a lot of people did last eight, really. Um, and so the Gorge was definitely going to be a lot of, and plus the Gorge is not easy to get to and not easy to be at. And, you know, you're, you know, even, even we doing it as easy as possible at the Gorge thinking, wow, it feels like I was just on a festival for a week. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, ex and so I kind of wanted to reward everyone who made it to the Gorge with a lot of the last versions of, of certain, of the big songs classic you know, they made the effort right. to be there um i thought about saint stephen a lot about a way to maybe just do a standalone and get it in there somewhere um i also you know i didn't want to cannibalize first set songs by just writing three sort of two second set shows because there's a lot of great first set songs that deserve to come out again you know um and i know bobby and john anxiously want to sing again you know and so i also think for the band's sake like they would rather have five shows to do a lot of songs one more time than you know have done more of them twice because it's also their last chance to play them in a stadium sing them in the stadium you know and uh and that so sort of keeping both that in mind that that they want to do as many songs as possible before they go out right. and you know i'm going to make an immediate left turn and since you mentioned <laughs> voices um how, how was it with setlist writing considering bobby's voice with all those shows so uh you know i i you know it's often why helps the franklin's ends up on night three um is just in case you know just in case his voice isn't going to be there because because i can't uh the new year's run when we did la and he lost his voice by new year's eve and i had already done like helps the franklin's althea night one and i was like oh fuck, how do we you know so if I've burned those songs and then his voice is gone, how do we salvage, you know? Cause also he's not, he's never gonna, you know, he will play injured as we all know, he will play, he will sing with no voices. He did do that new year's Eve and city field last summer. And, you know, you gotta, you know, he's going to play until you drag him off and he's going to sing until you drag him off. And so in a way I was, I was, and I over, you know, he was fine in San Francisco. I didn't have to do it that way. Um, but also, you know, want him to be as strong as possible for that last days between. I don't want him to struggle his way through it. It was kind of why you know, left one more Saturday night off that Saturday night because he throws out his voice on that screen. Mm -hmm. and, and and to answer what I know is another question out there, it's, it's the I've done it. I've opened shows and second sets, or I even want to put one my Saturday night before drums. I've tried to move it around. And after the, last time, after the last time last year, I moved it around. He said that always has to be the last song of the second set of the encore because once he does that scream, his voice is out. Um, right, and so I have right. to keep that in that slot. And 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 I, you know, I know one more Saturday night, we're playing the one last Saturday night. Right, and, yeah, and it made all, actually it. made all the sense in the world that night. But I'm thinking about that days between the next day. And I'm like, nope, I'm, nope. I'm going to, if we close. And, and also, he also, see, it, it, I sort of get him with his own logic sometimes. He also believes morning dew is always the closer. You can't really follow that. And if he feels it's a not quite a morning dew that got there, then he would just audible a closer after it. And so, you know, I don't need to worry about coming up with something to follow morning dew with. 
Right. And so if I close the Saturday night set to it morning due, then there's less worry about, you know, needing the one and more that's Saturday interesting, night there. Cause and Kevin I really want always... one more ripple encore. So once they go acoustic, one more Saturday night's out the window. Out the window, yeah. <laughs> and Kevin and I would always say, well, why not open with one more Saturday night? Like change it up and throw it as, a, as an opening song and, and throw it in there. Because you have did it. Uh, <laughs> you can't. <laughs> the only show that's open that I ever wrote that opened with one more Saturday night was further April Fool's Day 2010. And it was a Friday night. It was and a I nod to with, that Grateful Dead I show. Where with, they I believe switched. it went one more Saturday night, Foolish Heart, Ship of Fools, or something like that. And uh, uh, it was great. on a Friday night. Um, I also remember a killer second set. She came in through the bathroom window that Bobby sang off uh, off uh, Abbey Road. That was killer. Oh, you did the whole um, album, right? Over the Yeah, over the course the of that band, that band did the whole album over the course of a whole tour, one song a night um, in, in its proper slot. Um, and then the whole B-side was uh, uh, Phil's birthday night into drums, I think, or something like that. Um, it was cool awesome. very cool idea and uh um and so that was the only time i think i opened a show with i did have his first set closer and and into drums once or twice but like i said he that's a sort of bobby mandate it's got to close right. the show so that's makes you know. sense that's interesting because yeah we would bring that up all the time and ask that and now we have our answer kev that's oh, awesome right. great let's take another question from the people how much, how much? Of the final three shows set list stayed the same from your original draft um well the the night one you know what what got us to loser and uh you know loser was an audible on night three and new speedway boogie was a, a last second ad on night one and i think that's it i think everything else stayed true um okay i had come up with the you know i knew i wanted trucking in the encore slot when i wrote jazz fest um because I, I opened jazz fest and i love i kind of love opening and closing a tour with the with the same thing um you know with the sort of sandwich that way uh, i do love a good sandwich um <laughs> so but i you know i sort of did sandwich nights the second night um though the, the um you know playing and then other ones and um and then you know last song i sort of always knew it was gonna be not fade away once I once I knew they weren't going to learn or do an addicts or bid you good night, which you know was definitely talked about. Um, so you did talk about it. You did talk like, about it's, doing it's a definitely got to be. Uh, uh, I didn't really want to do addicts because that closed fairly well. That, and, yeah, and, that and, did fairly so well. But I figured maybe we it just bid felt you good different. Night. And 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 when I bring up we bid you good night to Bobby, he would go. He prefers addicts. Um, mm. And uh, and I know he recently it was uh, privately, but he recently did a solo acoustic version to send to someone. By himself that was rather beautiful um but uh you know it's it's a hard vocal song to to do and it's work and uh um so once i had decided not fade away i think i want to close the show or to close the tour um you know sort of at the same time i was like well I might as well open with it too and just sort of wrap the whole final shows in the you know our level now fade away thing um and also that would sort of telegraph it and maybe just take the sort of debating and you know away like now it'll sort of be a little obvious to more people it's probably gonna be not fade away that closes the whole thing and then so you know less less stress or pressure there um so i actually ran that by john first and he loved it um and then randomly mickey reached out asking what's your idea for the final songs and i just laid out this is what i'm thinking and he loved it and so you know Newer broke zone, down you know. was perfect bro, yeah, the fair right in the middle well broke down yeah it can't go out that way it's too damn sad and right you, know. you need you need something else but, uh, after it but, but and i yeah, thought trucking worked after, well before but also, you know they you know it was you know that we started on time that was a four and a half hour four hour and 25 minute show sunday night and so by that not fade away they were done i mean they didn't have another <laughs> note in them um and uh you know they almost barely got through that it felt like they they, they were you know it was, it was down course were tough they were they were they were beat up pretty good and plus, well, kind of you set weather. this question I mean, up that, that I wanted to ask you after um, that last show. What did everybody do after you guys walked? Was there a big dinner? Did you guys? So we had out? our end of tour gathering actually Saturday night, um, because some people were going straight home after the show, um, or had very early flights, and and you know, so we did the end of tour gathering uh, Saturday night after that show. Um, that way, everyone could just sort of, you know, because. Bobby couldn't theory go home. I didn't know what he wanted to do. Mickey, I think, was going home. And and uh um so it it yeah, we did that on Saturday night. And you know, and we'd had, like I said, we'd had more camaraderie hangs 
this tour than ever before. We had, you know, a giant hotel pool party in Raleigh, you know, with every whole band party that was staying there. That's actually when John came up to me with the, I got this idea, uh, Sugar Scarlet Sunshine, and then talked me through it. And, this, and then you can, you can listen to him talk more about it on, his, on the same interview from Friday night. But that, that was, that idea came up from a band hang pool party. And, and I was like, great, we got all the guys here. What do y'all think? And done and done. It's like, Fantastic. I picked which show would do it in, and then he wanted to do it a little better next time. And I was like, get ready, you know, Boulder. Just start prepping for it in Boulder, and it'll come back. Huh? Brought it back right, in Boulder. Are... And then he actually calls the segue back into Sunshine Daydream his favorite segue in the history of Dead & Company. And I will, again, go listen to his separate interview from Friday the 14th, and he can yeah. explain how, why and how all that is and came to be. But it was, it was pretty awesome. That's um, so cool. All right, I'm going to get you into the weeds a little bit here with this yeah. next one. Ah, there we go. What is, what the, is formula? the formula? Well, I used to have a system and a formula that I know a lot of people read about my GQ interview and probably my interview here where, you know, I would have my three screens with, with you know, the previous few shows set list, the master song list, and maybe last year's play in that venue. I threw all that shit out this tour. All that shit went out the window this tour. Um, I went a lot on, on feel. Um you know, this tour, I felt like I had, you know, on those previous tours, I sort of felt like the mission is making the people happy who are only coming to one show all year, as well as the people who are going to be at every show. And and then, you know, finding ways to split the difference or people who are, you know, there are people, there are a lot more people than people understand that only come to a, one or two shows a year and they want the soul food. They want Scarlet Fire, China Rider, Althea. You know that they, they, you know, they will never trade a Ramble on Rose for a Jack and a Rose, Jack and Rose. They want that Ramble on Rose. And then there's the people on the rail and people who come to lots of shows who want us to dig deep. And so I used to try to find that balance. Uh, this tour, I, I definitely lean more towards the chances are most of the people coming want one more China ride away more than they want me to, they or want them to do a, a, an unrehearsed, maybe crazy fingers or, or, you know, something like that. And we still got to that. We still did 112 songs this year. Um, 113, actually, I guess, uh, uh, I always leave Minglewood out of that count. I forget that was part of Cornell. Um, and, you know, uh, someone on, you know, maybe it was Reddit or somewhere, uh, posted like average Grateful Dead different songs from like 89 to 95 versus Dead and Company. And I mean, we are right on par with what Grateful Dead was doing in the 80s and 90s. And, and actually a bigger pool of songs. The last year the yeah. Dead played, I think they were at 75 total songs. Right. And, and Bobby always views these bands as like, to Bobby's mind, whether it was Further or or the other ones, 02, Dead 03, Dead 04, 09. In his mind, this that band is where they would be at in 1996 or seven ish like had they kept going and so it's not like okay we've got this new band with john mayer he's bluesy we're going to be the 1969 grateful dead this year like that's just not they don't work like that it is sort of to them a continuation of wherever 95 left off um so i think that's sort of why he likes the sets to flow in a similar way that it was doing there though he certainly gives me a lot of liberties in my occasional you know uh, overstacking set ones with set two songs and things like that. Um, and uh, um, yeah, that was, uh, I want to talk about that Warf Rat too. <laughs> Warf Rat is my all time favorite Grateful Dead song. So uh, uh, Ooh, I had to I get cool it into Warf San Rat Francisco. Um, I, I, had cool into San Fran I had to get it into San Francisco. I had to get it into San Francisco, but I also knew days between morning dew standing on the moon were baked in to set two. And I'm like, I'm getting Warf Rat into set one somehow. And uh <laughs> Yeah, I put it in a bird song slot. Basically, it's exactly what I did with it. I put a bird song went night two, and and I put, uh, or I'm sorry, night three, and I put a uh, warfare at night one. I think with Dodie's me and after, and mm -hmm. uh, and and I thought it was great. I actually, wish I did that more with warfare. It was the only first set warfare Dead and Company ever did. I had put it oh. pre drums once or twice in set two, um, just to you know get it in there. Um, but uh, um, I think I thought it worked great. And, yeah, I wish I, I wish it, I let me ask you, what about what about birdsong leading into drums at some point? Because to me, it always birdsong always reminds me kind of like a dark star. Like it has that space in it, you know, and those ways to kind of travel out. And I was always curious if you put that in the second set and lead that into drums at some point. But it has I never end. put it into drums. I put it into a set two when we had Brand from our Salas on set two, uh mm -hmm. lock in. Mm -hmm. And I feel like maybe once or twice other I put it on set two, but uh uh, uh I tend to need it. I need set one a little bit of set one stretch and and so it, it you know it just really 
it fits that spot. It fits there too too well. Um, yeah. The um yeah. the the first time they played Wharf Rat with the beautiful jam, that was the day yeah. I was born. Oh wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. It was my first thing. Uh, let's find this. Dupree's and Stag, I'm just randomly picking a comment question. Dupree's and Staggerly were constantly on my pre-tour. Can we do these tunes lists? And they they just I really thought John would sing the hell out of out of Dupree's and I know Bobby loves to sing Staggerly. In fact, one year with Rat Dog at the Beacon, he did all three traditional versions of Staggerly over different nights. There's a stack Oli and a uh, some other similar version, but uh, you know they just never learned them. And and, uh, and unfortunately, the, the answer to a lot of those song questions is, I can put anything I want on paper, but if they don't learn them, they can't. They ain't gonna play them, and, and I can't force them to to yeah. go learn the songs. And, and I know in theory, each guy on stage probably knows those songs, but they don't necessarily know the same arrangement. And so it still has. It just can't be done. It has to be right. rehearsed. Or as we learned with further, John Kay would start a song with like the seventy three version, but Phil's on the. 82 version and Bobby's playing what it would be like in 96 and, and, and well, you know, and then it takes them four hours to figure out a song as simple as a Dupree's diamond blues or, or, you know, or right. something like that. And so, uh, uh, okay. Um, so let that, maybe that leads into the, this question. Uh, John didn't want to do any of his solo tunes with dead and company. That's, that's the easy answer. And the band actually uh, last year or the summer before the, a couple of guys in the band got an itch to, try and get John to do his, uh, it's a really cool out, uh, well, it's outtake or, or just a, a rare tune, rarer tune, uh, Walt Grace's submarine test, something like that. It's called, and a couple of the guys actually went as far as learning it, but John was pretty adamant. He didn't want to do any of his own songs in, in, in dead and company. That's interesting. So that's your answer there. Yeah, right. that's cool to Very know because right. we brought that up a couple times too, and we're like, would they play any Mary songs? And a lot of the people in the chat, and we would talk like, no, they would never do that and whatever. But that's interesting that they would have done it. He just didn't want to do it. So yeah, I mean, this band could have crushed Gravity. Gravity, I'm sure. Yep. Totally, yeah. totally. Exactly. All right, so let's get into uh, uh, something that you know is is been debated online. You did not hear the some of the derogatory things about this tour that you had heard about past tours. You want to get into a little bit to it? I have a theory on what was going on. Um, you know, I'm not sure the beats per minute were any significantly higher than they have been in years past. Now, now an exception would be Sunday Night's Cassidy. That I don't know where the heck that came from. Um, uh, I've been waiting all year. Best one in years. Best one in yeah. years. Yeah, best one. I mean, yeah, easily. Yeah. Um, so. I think the tempos were steadier and not only are the tempo steadier, Billy's a, a swing drummer and Mickey's a percussionist and Jay is a very straight ahead, very simple drummer. And Jay leaves so he's a Ringo. Much, he's a Ringo. He leaves so much, right. He leaves so much. He's a, he, he's a drummer who supports a singer mm -hmm. and it's a lot different than grateful that drumming normally is. Um, and so I think because he plays so simple, there's room in between his quarter notes for guys like John or Bobby or even Mickey, who, you know, really, if you ask the band guys themselves, they'll say Mickey's playing this past tour is better than ever before. Um, it just allows more room for groove is how John would describe it to me once. And so the band, the tempos may feel faster, but it's a, not necessarily a scientific fact. They're just grooving a whole lot more and groove is what makes things danceable. And, and that's what they feel is really happening this summer um and uh you know uh, that was uh, what that i attributed i'm no expert on music yet. theory but that's your sounded right. smart <laughs> yeah, I, I, I i attributed to, to, to jay uh, basically what you were saying is that he was coming in it was something different from billy so it was like throwing a joker in the deck and you ended up with a different hand every night because of it yeah yeah in a way yeah um but uh you know and plus jay knows Bobby's arrangements and as crazy as sounds, yes, Billy knows all the songs. Of course he does from playing them forever, but not necessarily the same way as Bobby has. And so, you know, that requires a lot of rehearsal time for 112 songs in reality, uh, or a lot of sound check time. Um, this band barely, this band sound checked. This is the craziest other thing. This band sound checked and rehearsed less this year than for any other tour ever. Wow. It sounds like just a perfect storm of awesomeness that came together with the camaraderie. Jay, and, and, and I feel like just calling it last tour took that pressure off. You know, yeah. now we're not there, there you know, you're not building a... anything anymore. You're not worried about what's going to happen when we're here next year, or you know what I mean. Like, the, like the... I think just calling it last tour took the pressure off, and they were able the... to have a lot of fun. Yeah, 
Um, yes, there was we a story plays with these, I was hearing. Uh, Nikki oh. plays with these the whole time. These are two of the three he the threw at me during a, a rehearsal once. And I, as I've told him, I always keep, I'll keep any pair he throws at me. Um, <laughs> Do you track airplanes on the, on the runway with those? Yeah, right, I probably could. He, 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 he threw them with love. It wasn't an angry thing at all. Um, um, yeah, Billy can play fast. Bobby can play fast. Billy didn't quit the band because they were playing too slow. Um, if so, then, then, uh, whatever went on at the opening of the Billy and the Kids show in New Orleans uh, doesn't make any sense. Um, <laughs> All um, right. Let's try this one right. out. You know, it's another thing. They talked about it a bunch. They even went through a stack of Hunter lyrics that hadn't had music put to them. And uh, interestingly enough, with that stack of music, uh, Bill Kreutzman and Billy Strings wrote Thunder. And Bobby and Maddie Mishna wrote, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the name of it, but it's the one the Wolf Bros did in the middle of Eyes of the World and What's Going On, um, Big Sandy Creek. Uh, but somehow it just never got done. Um, so, uh, you know, it was it was just never, it just, yeah, it just just never happened. It, it takes a lot of work to do that. Um, and I think, I think it shows that in that, that, you know, Kreutzmann ended up using one of those lyrics for a new song with Billy right. Strings, who's a, very hungry Prolific. to write new music and, and Bobby did it right. And Bobby did it with the, the kid he mentors who, uh, you know, it's also very hungry. And, and, and so, yeah, th those were songs that we're hoping might become dead and company songs. And right. uh, Bobby is still writing. Bobby yeah, is still instead. writing new material. Uh, yes. Um, yes. Uh, and he's, we recorded most of a Wolf Bros record. Uh, that only actually has one new brand new track on it. Um, but he's got some sketches of songs with various writers, with J.D. Souther still coming out of the Guild. And uh, um, he's got that one song, uh, She Knows What I'm Thinking, um, that'll make the new record. Now we're in the Will He Ever Finishes Overdubs part of the new record. So it'll be a couple of years at least, probably. <laughs> and, uh, um, but we did that back in December. Um, but yeah, it just, it did. Dead and Company just never got fully into the, the songwriting process. Um, so instead, we got a new Billy String song and a new Wolf Bros song out of, out of that right. stack of lyrics. So you um, brought up the Wolf Bros. Let's dive into that. Um, there was uh, something happened this morning. Tickets went on sale. You want to get into a little bit about what's going on with that? Yeah. Um, you know, Wolf Bros, for those who don't know, is 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 a 10-piece band Bobby has. It started out of the trio that he formed with Jay Lane and Don was on Upright Bass. And we've since added Jeff Kimenti, Barry Sless on Pedal Steel. And then there's a five-piece uh, string and horn section, cello, violin. There's a, a, a Reeds guy who plays saxophone clarinets, uh, flute, bass flute, uh, all forms of sax, and a brass guy who does uh, two brass guys, trumpet and trombone. Um, and, you know, they, they were brought in to sort of be the improvisers when Bobby does orchestra shows, but the chemistry was so good, we kept them in in Bobby's band and made it a 10-piece. And, and, you know, the cool thing about that band is that band does the entire Weather Report suite, that band does the entire Terrapin Station suite. Uh, you know, that band, that that's a band where we get to dig deep. You know, that, that band does Dark Hollow and a lot of the sort of Bobby acoustic stuff. That band does way more cowboy, Bobby cowboy songs uh, in that do you, direction. Do you, find it, do you find it different? Do you think that they find it different if you can, you know, from watching it, the improvisation part of it, having a 10 piece? Is that harder than having a smaller band? Uh, yeah, because it can get cluttery. You know, it can there can be too much happening at once on stage. And again, people have to remember Bobby's a rhythm player, not a soloist. And so... You gotta leave space for him to hang notes and and you know for the wolf pack guys it's a lot of they're often they've never done shows like this before and they tend to get excitable and, and can play too many notes from time to time but uh you know it always it always comes back uh, it always comes back around um but that you know that's again that's a band where we can dig deep a little bit it, it can do you know we did it at the ryman where we're like can you know can this band do a dead and company type of set and so set two at the last ryman show of the last tour i believe was like it helps of franklin estimated eyes what's going on eyes about you know just that type of show and they can do that it's not what they're going to do every night um because it's going to get it's going to get jazzy i mean that tune broke out so what it was the first time bobby had played that since 95 um in, right. in just an improv jazz moment basically um it's, that, that it's so cool and, the yeah. uh the appearance of the rat dog tunes the evening mood tunes yes so we get we get, get into, we get into two gin and ashes and glass and uh um uh uh yeah, I got to get back into my Wolf Bros uh, frame of mind. It is crazy. It is that different. I can't write. In fact, uh, we're doing a, a little uh, 
this will be a teaser, but we are going to do a, a symphony show with uh, the Stanford Symphony Orchestra later this year, uh, at the end of October at the Frost. And uh, uh, you know, they, they the con, you know the conductor for there reached out about you know when he could get a, a set list. Uh, you know, we only have the, months. <laughs> the students will start. Well, the students will start rehearsing when they come back into session. You know, they'll they'll play with it a little bit every week. And I literally cannot write a Wolf Bros set list while I'm on a Dead and Company tour, and I can't write a Dead and Company set list while I'm on a Wolf Bros tour, um, it, even though it's in theory a very similar body of music. Uh, it's just so different to me. I just, I, I, it's two completely different headspaces. And how um, different is it writing for the symphony? Because I know Bobby talked about that on his Sunday night interview yeah. at the intermission a, lo a little bit about playing with the um, symphony. Well, it's easier in that right now. Uh, after the next piece, Giancarlo transcribes, we're still only at like twenty three symphony song so it's it's easy in that there's not enough and then and yeah i get to play with that like i got that morning do i think close the first set with that band and bobby would never let me do that with any of these other bands and and uh you know things like that i get get to mess around with it a little bit huh. um um but yeah no he, he uh um, that's great yeah and so very cool uh, so can, can we can we rewind a little bit since we're on yeah, the yeah. symphonies and talk about the kennedy center shows and yeah. um, just how that came about, because that was prestigious. I felt underdressed and I even wore a button up. <laughs> <laughs> and I came the night they weren't in tuxes and I still felt that's, underdressed. That's so funny. That's so funny. Um, yeah, I, I didn't know. I didn't wear a tux, but I think I wore a suit jacket a couple of nights and that's a lot for me. Um, so thanks to Section 119 for getting me that badass Skull and Roses suit jacket. <laughs> that, was, that was pretty cool. Um um yeah so that that was basically the that was every song transcribed over the course of those four nights because that was all we could do with the, with a lot of repeats i mean we, we had to repeat a lot there um the great thing about stanford is is they don't come with union rules so i i actually can write two healthier sets for that those will be you know won't be quite as long as a typical wolf bros or dead coast show but it'll be much closer to that than the typical you know just under two hours uh symphony show that you know you're sort of stuck with because of their union rules um and so you uh, got the kids instead the kids can play all night right <laughs> they can you know well they can't play all night but i can get uh i can do two more properly i can think i can do 275s with them at least and uh nice. yeah, no, were, and so that'll be there, cool That's were there cool. specific pieces of music constructed for that i felt like there were some yes. sections added to things yeah yeah i mean john carlo was given a lot of uh, latitude to be creative and so he you know a lot of what he likes to call a lot of his easter eggs are in there a lot of his signatures i guess i didn't know people who write symphony music tend to leave little sig hidden signatures that so you know it's their piece kind of thing and so those are scattered all over our <laughs> dead songs too and uh yeah you know he he you know he obviously when you're you're thinking about uh, Grateful Dead songs, you don't think about the woodwinds taking solos or things like that. And that that's thought of in, in these transcriptions, woodwinds, brass, percussion, you know. Right, but um, Bobby Bobby said something I feel like the night I saw him about, he's always envisioned Grateful Dead songs in this setting. Yes, he's he loves the big ensemble feeling. Um, and you can see that in sort of, it started with sort of what the campfire band was um because those guys from the national really understood ensemble playing they're not a jam band and and so that was the sort of first taste of of that feeling and and it's a lot like what the wolf bros like it's it's an ensemble style band i mean you, you know you're not going to get a flame throwing guitar player or a guitar solo out of that band it's just not there it is way more ensemble based um and you know having that one big sound that sort of moves together you know and uh, and yeah and that's that's what he's aiming for with the symphony um so you know it's 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 wolf bros is sort of a rock and roll jazz fest symphony and then the symphony shows are symphony shows they're exactly what they sound like um you know with 70 80 person orchestras um and you know we hope to be bringing you know we hope to hit some of the big orchestras next year like red rocks with colorado can, and can you live stream something like that with the student symphony i think we can <laughs> but, but with the professional, I, I remember Zap not there yet. One and one about symphonies and how much he had to pay him for practices. And... I, all the all that's only gotten worse. But we're <laughs> you know we are fighters, and I actually still have zooms every month or two with three or four members of the Kennedy Center, the National Symphony Orchestra, and the Kennedy Center Orchestra reps who actually want to help us navigate 
through some of these union issues to get Ooh. to a point where we can record stream all that. Um, you know, I'm not saying we're making much progress, but we're trying, you know, I'm not going to give up, you know, I, I don't, that would be so and, fantastic. I don't, I don't know why. I mean, I understand you want your money, but it's the sharing it. It's, it's what you're denying so many people. They're, they're uh, in my opinion, their union boss, their national union bosses are severely out of touch. But at the end of the day, of it's, it's yeah. not my union, and I will fight for my guy to get what he wants, but it's not on me to campaign through the National Musicians, Orchestra Musicians Union lobbying them to change their leadership and do things right so bobby could get a live stream like that if they can't figure out that this is hurting their careers um, right. and some of them know it i mean i had a, a guy i mean had to be couldn't have been more than early late 20s come up to me in atlanta while the band was just doing their encores without the symphony and ask about that and i said well us you know did you know this is what we offered you union and you guys came back with a quote that was quadruple the amount and we can't afford that and he had no idea and, and and he's like you know i'm a fish fan they live stream everything all the time like i right. understand why this can't be done i'm like oh so you do get it and i'm like well you need to explain maybe you need to teach your union bosses how live fish <laughs> works for so all they can your, understand talk, that this is right that this is uh talk to your union this actually yeah. helps and, and you know and that some of you guys would rather have two hundred dollars ten times throughout the year extra than two thousand dollars once you know because like I can't pay 80 musicians $2,000 for one recording. You know, like, I don't know where you think we're ever getting that back. You know? that's and, a big and some artists issue. do it like Zap. That's what Zap was saying. So, you know, if you're staying, you write the check and you don't care. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're just not in that position, um, especially not no. counting a 10 piece band on the road. Um, yeah. As, as you know, it's with the same, you know, it's very similar overhead to the Tri Anastasio band. It's not, it's 10 piece bands are not easy to move around. The, the logistics the must be from hell on that. It's tricky. Wow. <clears throat> oh, man. I remember Barry Sless used to pay with a band called um, Section 8, and they played at this place oh, called wow. the 15 Mile House. And if you were like, if you could put your hand, head over the bar, they'd serve you. And they played like Wednesday nights and did all Grateful Dead covers. And then years later, he was with Dave Nelson, and now he's... Um, he was in Phil and Friends for a while. I first met him during uh, early 2000s Phil and Friends. Uh, in 05, I remember he was on those John Mayer shows in 05. We actually were talking about that. Uh, he was a, he was at one of the Boulder shows and all three San Francisco shows. And we, we were talking about that that little run with Chris Robinson and Joan Osborne and, and John yep. Strio opening. Um, hey, thanks, Barry's, Mike. Barry's man. great. He's also just a wonderful human. He's just one of those guys you love having him around. That's very cool. Very cool. Shout out to Mike uh, M. That's huge, man. Thank you for the uh, super sticker. It's 20 bucks. That's amazing. I did open Bethel set two last year with good times. How about that? <laughs> I'm glad it worked. I guess I didn't think it did because I didn't remember it. <laughs> See that? <laughs> there you go. All right. So let's uh all right, let's ask a fun question here. Hopefully. Funniest fun. thing, the strangest thing. Um wow. <laughs> I might need a minute on that. Um, <laughs> what is the funniest thing, strangest thing that happened on the tour? Jeez, uh, it's all such a blur right now, man. I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna. I may need to come back to that one when when I when I can think of it. Um, no. Um, jeez, yeah, I'm I'm not sure. Um, oh, it was a long tour. I'm sure it's a lot to process. Yeah, I mean, we, there was a lot of laughs. I just can't think of that one that. Uh, uh, well, um, how about let, let, let me throw this at you. What about the infamous uh, John Mayer speech at Cornell? Didn't he like hit the band together beforehand and say, "Let's kick some ass"? Or to yes. paraphrase him, so <laughs> yeah, something like that. Um, you know, but I don't, you know, I don't know if that was the funniest or, or strangest. Um, yeah, he was, you know, and the whole band really. It, it wasn't. He didn't have to sell it to the guys. Like, like, you know, we're not mourning this thing. We're celebrating that we had the longest running Grateful Dead reunion band since Jerry passed, that we had the most successful longest running Grateful Dead reunion band since Jerry passed that, you know, um, you know, all really happy for Jay Lane getting this chance. He's earned it. You know, he's been mm -hmm. Bobby's guy for 25, 30 years and never got to, never got to step up into the big band. Uh, yes, there it is. Steely Tom nailed it. The walk in at Fenway was the wildest, craziest part of it all. There you go. See, I, I filibustered enough to get to the, get to the answer <laughs> I wanted. So Fenway in years past, we used to park our buses in the, what they called the Triangle T lot. And then uh, 
you know, the runner SUVs would pick us up, a motorcycle cop would lead us down Lansdowne Street and in the back to the stage because they can't really close those streets down because you got the House of Blues, you got all this other activity out there that is public. Uh, but they turned the Triangle T lot into the MGM Music Hall, which is now a like 4,000 capacity concert venue that also had shows while we were playing Fenway. And the House of Blues had sold out shows while we were playing Fenway. So we were parked in the media lot and then expecting the similar, we'll get a ride in SUVs and the motorcycle cop will lead us through the crowd and go inside stage. And the cop said, we're not, we, these streets are too crowded. We can't do that. Like, uh, so night one, we're basically like, how are we getting in the venue? And <laughs> so we kind of came up with a plan where we're only, I think only Bobby and Mickey were on the buses and everyone else was in the clubhouses for the dressing rooms. So we would just drive Bobby and Mickey to the clubhouse where we meet with John and the other band. And then we would just have to come out the dugout and walk through the crowd and get to stage. Well, Bobby steps off the bus. We start, you know, the security guy's like, no, I'm just going to, we're just going to walk. You know, it's, it's 200 feet away. We'll just gang walk it. And they step out and gate B is right there, the public entrance. And Bobby goes, fuck it. Let's just go in. And right in the main gate through the concourse. And, and you can, I mean, the Conqueror's going bonkers, yelling, and they can't believe what they're seeing. While John and all, they, you know, they're coming through the field at the same time. And everyone just kind of met on stage. Um, so awesome. the uh, the second night, we're like, we got to do this together. And we'll get double the security detail, but we'll do it together. But we'll just, you know, but the walk actually is, if you're a baseball fan, you'll love this. And I am a baseball fan as much as I, I hate the Red Sox. I had to appreciate this moment. But we're walking into the Red Sox clubhouse down their stairs to their tunnel through their tunnel up their dugout steps we're in the red sox dugout out onto the field that glorious view of the green monster that every baseball player in history has had and then led through the field and of course it's not a straight line because it's the barricade of the field so we're like zigzagging in and out of the crowd the crowd's going nuts the whole stadium is cheer it was like the most rock star entrance ever and that's how we took the stage and and on and then uh and then i guess the the uh you know, the, the runner up there, if that was the strangest thing that ever happened for me, the funniest thing that ever happened was the last night set to at San Francisco, our, our stage manager who's actually John's production manager came up to me and he's like, so I've, I built a little door in the center of the rail. How about you, I, and a couple other people go to the front row center for like a song tonight? I'm like, I'm in, fuck it, let's do it. I'm like, but we got, you know, let's grab Natasha, we'll grab, you know, like Chloe maybe or whoever and. I tried to get John's tour manager to do it, and he he, he bailed, but but I almost had him, which is a win in of itself. And so, you know, he's the guy I call house lights to, Chris Chris Gott, um, our stage manager. So I was like, I'm going to call it. When I call the house lights to you, just come to me, and we're going to go straight down. We'll do it for just help on the way, and then we'll get out of their way. And and I guess Dan Berkowitz, who runs the early entry 100X VIP program, actually went and talked to all of them to say, hey, if some guys from the stage and management want to come up front, you know, will you make room for them? They were thrilled to make room for us. And so um, we did that. We came down to the rail and we were right there, front row center, my arms on the rail. And right away, I see Jeff Comente makes eye contact and just starts laughing. He blew me, he blew us a kiss. Um, <laughs> you know, Bobby, I didn't expect to see us. He's always looking 100 miles away. I didn't really have a great view of O'Teal. Jay could see me and Jay was just like, look confused. Um, and then it was so good. We didn't leave. Like it's now Slipknot. And I'm like, I ain't going anywhere. Like I'm at least here through Franklin's and then somewhere. And if you go back and watch the video, you can see the point where John then recognizes me and Chris on the rail and you can see him at first light up. And then you can see him kind of like trying to fight back smiling and he's trying not to look at us. Cause he'll keep laughing if he looks at us. And then once he came to his first solo in Franklin's, I think it was his first solo. I think it was after the second verse. He just sold out to us. He's like, fuck it. I can't not do it. And he just like played that whole thing right at the two of us. And it was it was really funny. And it was really fun. And I turned around to everyone around me. I'm like, OK, I understand why you guys love being up here so much. Now I get it. <laughs> Once you have a taste of the rail, it's hard to go back. Yeah, and right? like it was over. We got uh, out of their way and, uh, uh, you know, let them have it back. And, and uh, that was that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that way more than I, I, I expected to. Um, and so uh, that's very yeah, cool. those would be the two there funniest, is. strangest stories I could come Get, up with. <laughs> let me circle. That's let me circle story. you back to yeah, Cornell. Please. How did you decide on the Cornell set list? Because everyone was debating, is it going to be a repeat of the original? Yada, so yada. in Mexico, I got the guys together to ask, just ask what they you know, do. They have that in mind. Are you guys looking to do five eight seventy seven over again, or or how do you want to approach it? And every one of them, to a man, was like, Mac, just do your thing. Just do what you do. 
you know, we, we, you know, we trust you. Just, just, just do what you do. And so I was like, okay, that sounds like pressure now. <laughs> and so I didn't think about it for a while. And then when we announced and the announcement was definitely a bit bumpy, people didn't understand it was a benefit. The ticket price was so expensive, but people not understanding thought it's a benefit, but it's also a venue. I mean, you know, we're selling tickets in stadiums and our average ticket price in stadiums is $250. And now we're playing and we're selling all those out like that. And now we're playing a venue a tenth the size of a stadium. So in theory, the prices should be 10 times the price of the stadium shows. They weren't even that high. We had student tickets, you know, that were like $77. Uh, so the average ticket price was nowhere near 10 times, you know, what, nowhere near what we could get for them. But it doesn't matter. That messaging wasn't getting across and we were getting killed. And I remember I was on the phone with one of the other managers with Bernie, um, you know, sort of talking through how, you know, we need to fix it. I was pushing for free live streams and, and, you know, things like that. And I was like, you know what, this has to be the greatest show they've ever played. That's the only way out of this. This has to be that by the time this show is done playing, no, all that nonsense is forgotten about. And the show's just so fucking good that they, that there's just no debate. This needs to be their version of five, eight, 77 without playing five, eight, 77. So I'm going to write dead and companies. Great. Not the grateful dead's greatest hit list. But Dead and Company's greatest hit lists. And I'm telling you, I wrote that, I actually wrote that set in like 15 minutes, maybe. It so got tweaked. Big, it got tweaked a little bit here or there because I I I you know I want I need to move some things to Jazz Fest and move some other things. You know, I had to do some moving around because I wrote that before Jazz Fest. Um I knew I would open Jazz Fest with trucking, but hadn't done anything else there and and had already and just that one just kind of came right. I just I don't know how it happened because it just kind of flew, you know, just flew out of me. Um, you, you like the fake out there and, uh, to open the show that got added after the fact um that did get added after the fact i just want to make sure they would be cool with that yeah i, I don't like to i don't want to i don't want to do something like that and them not realize it you know that we're doing a fake out here so i want them to know they're doing a fake out before you know just so they're not i don't want them to be surprised by something they're playing i'm not right well you did the woodstock set blind. yeah but I, I actually asked them all in advance would, would this is my idea what are you guys up for it and they loved it to a t they wanted to do it and it's um, one thing to write the set list, but yeah. they still got to come out and play it and perform Right, so I, I need them to own what they're doing. I don't want to surprise them it. with some weird idea. Like, like, by the way, Minglewood was the opener of 5877, and then you're you're faking them out in Althea. Uh, sorry, I didn't tell you. Ha ha. You know, like, I can't do that. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, they're the pranksters, not me. You know, like, <laughs> you know, I, I, I feel, you know, I got to serve them. So I don't want to be, you know, pranking them at the same totally. time. Um, no. I mean, look, I, every now and then I've done things and like, you know, that. I don't know if they've acknowledged it or not. I mean, Bobby gets everything I do, but I, I don't always know that the rest of them pick up on some little messages I put in these things, or that's why this song is here tonight, you know, kind of thing. Um, you know, but like, it's, it's like when I write, you know, when I wrote those, uh, you know, when we write protest shows, it's like, it's also a balance, you know, it's like we did that show at Wrigley the day Roe got, uh, Oh yeah. You know, yeah. The women by the Supreme, right. you know, the, the, yeah. The Supreme court fucked everyone. It's like, I got to write that. I got to write that show. I got to say, fuck you back to them. Or, you know, they want to say, fuck you back to them. It's not even like, I got to. But at the same time, we're playing a stadium. And there's a lot of people here who just want to hear the best Grateful Dead show they can hear. And so, you know, balancing protest shows with that, you know, is is, is tricky. Because, you know, you, you, the band wants the message to get across. But at the same time, we have to, end, you know, people have to get their money's worth. You know, nice, um, nice job with the uh, throwing also in Bristow, since there was lots of famous people in the audience that night. I'm Did sorry, you know, the, you, you know, the Treasury Secretary was there when you put throwing in. Oh, yeah, I met him that night. Okay, yeah, <laughs> of course, oh, no, Bobby, Nail, Bobby, right. Bobby leaned into the you can buy the whole damn government today oh. line. Oh, you knew he was there. No, it's funny because when I met Jerome Powell, yeah, you know, he 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 likes to fuck around with the guitar. So uh, and also, you know, the 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 main CNBC reporter who covers the Fed is Steve Leesman, who has a dead cover band called Stella Blues Band in, in New York City area. Um, and so I actually texted him. I was like, Jerome Powell's here in catering. What do I say to him when I go up to him? And he goes, oh, well, he's a big Yorma fan, big, you know, big dead fan. Like, you know, he, he you know, he likes to fuck around with the guitar. So uh, I just went up to him. and I said, hey, uh, good friend of mine, Steve Leesman said, I should ask you about your guitar playing. He goes, Oh, I know Steve, but he's a much better guitar player than me. And, uh, you know, and then, and, and, yeah, he was, you know, it was nice enough. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, that, that's, that's is he's it making a statement. Yeah. Is Bobby trying to make a statement? Oh, he's trying to make a statement. That song every time. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's and, great and, that and, he and, believes it's still where he yeah. is because a lot of other bands, you get some out of touch songs from them. Yeah. I mean, he, Bobby, 
believes we can all still impact change, you know, just by doing the little things we do. And, well, and head, you know, can, can we do headcount for a minute? They yeah. raised more money this tour than combined yeah. every other tour. Yep. Yeah. This Huge. is everything. Yeah. Everything. I mean, I've talked to I talked to shakedown vendors who were like, I made ten times more money this tour than any other tour. Like, like that's not even just us. Like everyone. I mean, it was, it was good for everybody. We we had the most views on our after shows. Like I was talking. Was... I was. I talked to three or four different shakedown vendors at Wrigley. I remember who were like, "I've never reordered product mid tour, and I'm on my second reorder already." You know, like that kind of thing. Like, like they. It was, I, well, I was, my... made me so happy to hear that. Like, the, well, yeah. they were. Right. You you met my kid and Billy too. the first thing when right. we walked in. She was like, "Can I get a shirt?" I was like, "If you want a shirt, we're getting you a shirt." Girl. <laughs> I know we're running up on against time here. I think we're definitely going to go a little longer though, Kev. I still good with me. Oh uh, yeah, we'll go as, as long, long as, as Matt's around. willing. I'm as here. As long as the public isn't flooding out the door, I'm good. Though. Yeah, right. And I, I still got a couple I wanted to ask you. Anyway, actually, we're getting going more back people. to kind of going back to kind of the 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 Boulder shows and even the uh, the the closing show, the drones. Where did those come about, and what was the you know, how did that come about in, in the play and, and what was the reason for and bringing them back? Was it the same company you used again? I know they came out of the ship that time and uh, in San Francisco and everything. And I know the one yeah, with I don't know if it was the same company. Uh, it started with the city of Boulder doesn't allow fireworks anymore. And we wanted to do something. And uh, well, as a dog so, owner, I think every dog owner thanks you. Yeah, for not doing the, there's a Colorado anymore. based group. Uh, I, I know it's partly led by Kimball Musk, uh, who Bobby played a, a, a charitable thing for out in Aspen a couple of years ago. And I think Jeremy Stein, who used to be Madison House String Cheese Management, is, is a part of that group. He was also part of Fairly Well Production. Um, so so they were sort of behind the that. And I think Don Strasberg, the promoter there, had done something with them at Mile High Stadium once before. And so that was where the concept came up. Um, and then I don't know if it was the exact same people for for San Francisco or not. I just, you know, uh, it, I wasn't really involved in the production of that. Right. Only I, to the I point where we're trying board. to figure out where they would start launching and how long things are if they're going to, you know, because it's timed and and you know, I got to do the average song timings to try to help them pick that. Because originally at Boulder we were going to first launch it during He's Gone, so it would do a steal your face right in time for that line. But then the weather delay. And the fact that the winds never really died down kind of messed with us trying to do it that way. So that's when we kind of kicked it to we'll do it at the end. Once he hits the beam, because Mickey calls the beam droning. You know, in fact, he used to wear that hat or shirt that say drone, not drones, because he refers to him as beaming as droning. And so we're like, well, Mickey's going to kick off the drone. He's going to make the drone sound and the drones are going to take off into the sky. And it's going to sound like the sound of them launching. And sure enough, that's the, the Pythagorean. You can't hear them launch, but Mickey's beam sounds like you're hearing them launch. Like it, it, was, it was amazing. What, what is that called? The Pythagorean monochord or something like something that? Like that, that. that I, I don't know for sure. <laughs> I, I put it in its sure. setlist one night on one of the shows. <laughs> Like the drones, it's great. No, that's that's really cool. And that was a fun. That was a fun extra thing. We thought maybe you'd do it at the gorge because you know the, the open space. Yeah, why there. no but gorge? I think, it, I think it worked um, well waiting until San Francisco to bring them back. I think it was the right move anyway. Um, I don't know why we didn't do it at the gorge. To be quite honest, uh, I don't know if we can do them at the gorge. I that's think what I that, thought was maybe I, I you think couldn't light do pollution. it. Pollution. It's probably light I pollution. Think it, there's that issue, and it's there. a national I, park I, it or something up. anyway. And I don't think you're really it allowed to up. have. Um, and then San Francisco. It's funny. I never asked because I just sort of once it went so well in Boulder, I just assumed okay, we're doing that again in San Francisco, <laughs> and and then I just sort of waited for when I you know I, we have a 110 person road crew. We have probably 30 people who could say they're part of management. I don't need to dip my hands into every single little corner of this operation. And, mm. and, uh, and, and, you know, I, we have an amazing team, so I don't have to. And, and, you know, so stuff like that, I just wait until my contributions needed for it. And that's uh, no, no, it. They, it's very cool. You, you had the set list written. So you beforehand, you provided them what songs so they could work the graphic into that. Or did they say, Hey, we're going to use a steely and we have the flying eyeball and we have, I think we discussed what we wanted to see with them. Um, the flying eyeball, I don't know where it came from. I, I know, I remember initially hearing some ideas about what they were going to do, the, you know, in Boulder and the steely, the different steelies and the please be kind and and that. Um, I'm not really, really not sure where the eyeball came from. That was fucking cool. <laughs> um, you know. Why is there a curfew at the Gorge, Jacob? I'm paraphrasing you. It seems like you're in the middle of nowhere again. Is it because it's a park and that old deal? 
something like that. Um, I, I really don't remember the, the specifics. It, it is union, so it could also just be costs. Um, you know, is you know a lot of times even if there isn't a curfew, all these venues run with hourly labor, and so you're paying you're for a whole hour. Everyone an hour, minutes. which might be time and a half or double time at that hour. You and know, those four people working and, and stuff want to get out of there. Too. And some of those people just want to go the fuck home and don't even yeah, want the extra right. hour. And sometimes you're looking at 60, 70 grand just to they should build like do that lawyers. five minute encore and it sort of becomes they you should know, build like lawyers in six minute increments. <laughs> Shifts and just have like an extra house over there where they just come out and like they just trade off. <laughs> right. Well, I mean that that it, it, the great thing about the uh Atlanta Symphony Orchestra was they build their overtime in five minute increments. I'm like, oh, great. Then I will take 10 minutes to do one more song. Thank you. And I actually bought, bought that the night before the second show just to make sure we got that Terrapin Station suite in that that, that, that next night. Because that whole Terrapin Station suite symphonic is like 22 minutes. Um, and so, uh, yeah. It's like a um, vending machine. You're like, I'll take 10 right? minutes. I was like, I was like, all right. Because I, 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 what happened was I, I thought it was 15 minute increments. I'm like, well, if I'm paying them 15 minutes, I'm adding songs. Like, don't think I'm paying you 15 minutes and sending them home after five. Like, no, I'm going to go tell Bobby to add a song. He goes, oh, no, no, we're doing five-minute increments. I go, really? Like, Great. I need eight minutes for the song, so I'll buy 10 and done. And yeah, I felt like I was like in a quickie mark. Awesome. <laughs> Take two two squishies and 10 minutes over. That should Perfect. work. That should work. That's great. Uh, so one more question. about. I know you, from me anyway, I'm sure we have a few more. But um, you mentioned Warf Rat's your favorite tune uh, overall. What was your favorite tune on tour like that you thought they really excelled in playing this tour? Like your favorite kind of thing to hear, kind of the best one that you thought was the sort of the MVP song of tour. I know Mayor crushes Althea. He kind of owns that one now as sort of the MVP of his thing. I know Telio came up a lot. Cumberland was special. Cumberland. Well, I have to choose one? just one. It's probably Cumberland, but Cumberland and I is both come come right. pretty close for me. Like now, I did not. I was very con conscious to not miss any Cumberlands or Eyes this tour. Um, How did they come up with the new little sections? Eyes seemed like it had a new section in it. Did that just happen organically, or it comes up sometimes at sound check, or just you know, it, it, or they just talk it down? You know, like like Bobby's always looking for a way to make the same a little different, and so they talk stuff down. Sometimes it gets too complicated, and then it doesn't happen. Like he was trying to find out a way to stretch out Loose Lucy, and I think it actually worked. I think it was a 10, 12 minute version the last what? one. Um, but that's kind of what burned him on its all over now is he was trying to find a way to stretch it and adding all these sections into a song they hadn't played in five years when we only had a 30 minute sound check. And, and so it's like, uh Oh, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the bit and eyes I said on one of the after shows by the end of tour, it kind of was expected almost like the King Solomon G would get in the 73 mm -hmm. eyes, you mm -hmm. know, that disappeared after a while, but hearing it over and over, I was like, yeah. Oh, that belongs the there. That's right. Yeah. Yep. 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 No, it's Eyes really was, cool. I mean, it was definitely an MVP song. It, it kind of had that same thing at Telio. It kind of brought back some of those early versions of the yeah. quicker sort of feel to it and that, yep. those kind of things, which was and just... Then, yeah, and then O'Teal's bass solo is always great. And Yeah, and if he scats in his bass, he just does that. That's just, you know, he's been doing scatting bass solos since the Allman Brothers. Um, oh, and, Colonel uh, Bruce. Um, he did it with Colonel Bruce. Actually, yeah, it probably goes back yeah. to Colonel Bruce. My, yeah, my, my earliest uh, seeing him up close was... Uh, with the Almond Brothers, and he actually used to sing. Uh, so shortly after Jerry died, the Almonds started doing. I think they were segueing "Blue Sky" into Franklin's Tower, if I remember correctly. And uh, yeah. Teal would sing Franklin's Tower, and uh, um, it's funny because I remember a couple of times this tour, uh, Young Ryan would hit me up and think he was hearing Almonds licks in in Franklin's Tower, and I'm like, and I actually asked John about it. I was like, "Did you drop a Blue Sky tease in the?" And he goes, "No, but I do this sort of slidey thing with my hand, and it." sounds almond that almonds esque um, but it made perfect sense he heard something almonds in franklin's because obviously there's a key thing that makes blue sky and franklin somehow work together mm -hmm. so it, it was you know perfectly have, have you heard any hearing that have you heard any of O'Teal's album that he recorded up in Iceland? I've heard the whole thing. Actually, he sent it to me uh, a week ago, and and, uh, and I love it. You'll y'all you'll, you'll love it. Can't wait. And to it's hear called it. it's called um. It's a lyric uh, from Standing on the Moon or something like let that. Let me. I, I don't know if what I have has a title on it or just a, a link. Let me look real quickly here and see if I can even. Uh, actually, I don't have, have it on my left on my iPad. Right. So I, I think I think that it's it's uh, a lovely view of heaven is what it's called. Oh, that well, that would make because it was in Iceland. Obviously, you're as close to heaven as you're getting. <laughs> if you, I don't know wherever heaven yeah. is, um, West Virginia. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so, uh, yeah, I ju I've just heard wonderful things about it. And I think back to all the songs that he sang, you know, which I guess it's basically going to be a lot of them. Um, I'm just so excited yeah. for it. How hard yeah. was it to pick the, like, to get O'Teal songs in there in the set? I know Jim Mayer told you, oh, don't worry about me singing or whatever. How hard, you know, was mixing in the O'Teal versions? Or the it's tricky because all he sings is ballads. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think I talked about this last time I was on here. I saw sort of started, you know, a year or two ago writing one less slow song per night just to, you know, to sort of respond to tempo criticisms. Um, and so that became, you know, that's again what happens to things like Loser and Rogue Jimmy and 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 O'Teal's ballads and you know they have a lot of great slow songs. Must have been the Roses. I mean, there's so many great slow songs. They're beautiful, but you can't really do more than one a first set. And then you got the big ballad set too. That's going to come from the same pool of big ballads. And so those first set, you know, it just kind of that those are the songs. Coveted that just spot. Kind of, it's coveted. Yeah, I kind of ran out of the spot for it. like it came literally came down to the last slot in the three shows is High Time or Loser. And I went back to the other two shows anywhere I could cram a loser on here, especially show one. And, you know, it just it just wasn't there. He always got um, his fire on the mountain, though, which also he crushed, I thought, yes. always, too. So, so what, what was up with stuff. the rap? How did the rap come about? And was there supposed to be another one? Because there's theories going around that Mickey didn't get his second rap. So uh, it came from Mickey Camp. I, I remember Raya coming up to me, City Field, and I went. And she it was funny because I think she was nervous to ask me, thinking I might hate the idea. And I loved the idea. I was like, that. I fucking love it. I'm like, and I, again, I, 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 pick, I, pick, I also picked Boulder. Um, I said, have him be ready for Boulder. I'm like, that, that late in the tour, we're going to be doing a lot of the same songs and any way to make the same look different, it'll be really cool for people. Um, so that's when they worked it up that he would just take the third verse. Um, and then I had heard back that he wanted to do the whole thing at City Field. Um, but uh, it, it, I don't think he was feeling it at sound check. He did kind of sound check it. And at the start of, you know, as we were coming back for set two, I just happened to see Mickey go up to O'Teal and go, go, can you sing it tonight? And O'Teal said, sure. And we went on stage and, and that, that's just how it went down. And they came, cause um, we saw him come up and pull away the teleprompter. Oh, okay. Yeah. That was probably just getting, so th yeah, that, that started. He needed, uh, certainly. Um, it was th no, that was, it, it was decided in advance that he wasn't going to, that he wasn't going to sing it. He I went, think I it made it a little bit more, you know, not special. Maybe he made it a little more dramatic that way or something. And it made it, you know, yeah. And it um, made it more cool that he just did last, it once. So the only thing I can think of with that is that at one point, Mickey was, there's actually six verses to Fire on the Mountain. And at one point he was going to put in some of the, a couple of the other verses. I don't know if he's going to do all six. Um, <clears throat> So it's, the only thing I could think of is that we probably never told the prompter guy about the switch because it happened so late. Like we were literally walking to stage or to the golf carts to go to stage when I saw Mickey tap O'Teal on the shoulder and go, hey, can you take it tonight? Um, and uh, Well, I just lay off the deadheads how they latch one so, to anything. Yeah, I think <laughs> I, my guess is the only thing I can think of is maybe the prompter had all those other lyrics that O'Teal wasn't going to sing. And Mickey, like it probably would confuse him to be staring at at right. lyrics that he's not going to sing so or that no right. one's going to sing. Basically, the right. form on the prompter was probably wrong. Right. And O'Teal doesn't need the prompter for it. He'll just sing it. And so, uh, again, I'm, I'm a little bit of speculation, but there was no drama there because I literally watched Mickey tap O'Teal on the back, on his back. Well, and go, hey, I didn't take think it so either, but um, pe people so. did send questions. Oh, they, oh, they always do. I mean, I've, I've read stuff, you know, did you see how John looked at Bobby? He must be furious. And I'm like walking off stage to two guys who are laughing and cracking up and cutting up with each other, having the best time of their lives. Well, and so, that's the know, other thing is I think I, I only trust show. my own uh, interpretation of stage body language and eye contact and that kind of stuff. <laughs> and, 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 and you else. know, and we, and Kevin, and I um, talked about that often was the body language between mayor and Comente the whole time. And yeah. you could see it after every show, the love that those guys had and the fist bumps and yeah. the, 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 the hugging and just sort of the, the uniqueness. It was so cool to see. And I yeah. mean, I love Comente's fist bump tradition. It is, it is one of my favorite uh, things. He, he goes, uh, depending who's standing stage right at the moment, I think he goes Natasha, AJ, Bobby security, me, then John, and then he's on. Um, and there was one night and I forget what I was doing, but like I, once I called house lights, I had to bolt and handle something. So I called house lights and bolted and somewhere around the start of the second song, I hear a call the radio get to stage, right? 
And I come up to stage right and I look at AJ, I'm like, what's up? And he points at Jeff and Jeff waves me over and it's like crawling into his little world. And he, because I had run off, he'd never fist bump me and he had to do it because he was like, I'm not settled. You know, it's like part it's of his superstition. He's like a superstition goalie. or whatever, a tradition, <laughs> whatever it was, he had to fist bump me before uh, it got to be too it. late. All right. So, it. so it let's I end with a question. question. Quick, since we got a, yeah, a, a from MTV there. Question. Oh, love it. You know, and, and little teases like that always. You know, the guys who recognize it will turn and smile, like all that kind of stuff. That's the band, you know, just sort of, you know. Uh, you know um, the way they, uh, Steely yeah, Tom was telling me in Bristol. Yeah. Steely Tom told me in Bristol they did uh, Julian Lennon's song. He teased it in Deal or he something. Did. Yes, he did. Uh, I asked him about that one at some point, and that was definitely a, a straight tease. There was also a, was there maybe a Jackson Brown tease or something else that was pretty noticeable. That's at the cool. Gorge, I thought he was going to go all the way a, a few years back. I mean, maybe five, six years back. Coming out of the wheel, he would sometimes fall into singing a couple of lines out of Diamonds on the Soles of Her Shoes. And I mm -hmm. thought they were falling into that groove. And I was actually walking the house and I was caught on the lawn around that point. And I think I actually just spontaneously shouted, just fucking sing it already <laughs> <laughs> to All nobody right. in particular. But like it was sounded like it was getting that close that, that uh, um, you know, that, yeah. That, and we've uh, gotten it a few times in the question. So I got to ask it for the fans. Yeah. What, what happened with Bobby's mic at the gorge when he punched it? The famous mic. So slap. this time um there was a problem so they step on pads in front of their microphones that turn the mic on that way the mic isn't always on and collecting noise it doesn't need to be and i, I don't i think the pads connect to, something happened with the pad where it wasn't sensing his feet and so it wasn't turning on and he was singing and nothing was happening it was not coming through the pa it was not coming through the I was also when it went right before when he started first singing part of the 11 and nothing was happening. I thought I was out in the house again. I thought he was blowing the lyrics. And I looked up at the screen and then I saw no way he's singing and nothing's happening. Fuck. And then I beeline straight for stage right to, to see what was happening. But yeah, basically he was stepping on the pad and it just wasn't sensing his feet. So it wasn't turning his mic on. And, you know, different than however many years ago it was when he also punched out the microphone. That mm -hmm. time he was stepping up to it and it was shocking him every time he went to sing. He was getting an electric shock. Um, and so that was the other time he punched the mic out. And uh, so that's, yeah, that's, awesome. that's well. good to hear. That's, it's good to know. That's, it made for a great little meme and, and a little gift there for it. Anyway, it was, it was good. And yes, I agree. We heard Mickey better throughout the tour. The band agrees. They heard Mickey better throughout the tour. And they absolutely felt Mickey's playing was better this tour than ever before. Um, My favorite yeah. Bobby is, uh, I guess, Shoreline one year when he kicked the amp. He like full up got his leg up and did a side plan against the cabinet on stage. He once kicked out uh, Jay's <laughs> bass drum head at Westbury Music Fair, I think 2005 maybe or something like that. He's just had his moments. Passionate. He's passionate very about passionate. what he's doing. He's very passionate about this music. It is and you know, when things go wrong on stage, it pisses you off. Like you're a professional. You want everything yeah. to run right. So and, and this, I get it. you know, he takes this, very, he does not take this for granted. He takes this very seriously. All right, so we're gonna we're diving into uh, Wolf Brothers, like we were saying earlier. Now, yep. how long is the tour? How many dates do you have on it? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't really know the number of shows. Fourteen or fifteen. There's there's seven shows at Willie Nelson's Outlaw Tour, one show at the Park City Song Summit, and then we're doing two set evening with shows in I believe Charlottesville, Baltimore, uh, uh, Baltimore Pier Six, of course, uh, the Met in Philly. Um, uh, that place Shelburne outside of Burlington, Burlington, Vermont, or South Burlington, that, that outdoor Shelburne room. Uh, I can't remember the mm -hmm. name of it fully. And uh, uh, Mershon on the uh, University of Ohio campus in Columbus. I think those are the evening with shows. And then we have Willie Nelson Day Outlaw Tour Days. She also has string cheese on it in uh, outside of Nashville, Tennessee, Simpsonsville, South Carolina, um, Forest Hills, Bridgeport, SPAC, and Great Woods, and Pine Knob, and uh, pine off my 50th nice. birthday for anyone who's around michigan come on out nice and uh um and then then we finished up that part with uh farm aid at deer creek which looks pretty awesome oh um, there you go so how different is it writing a set list for a festival versus the evening wish shows um you know i think park city is gonna probably be a front-loaded heavy show in my opinion i feel like a lot of fresh ears two set show first wolf bro show after dead and company probably want to show off what this band can do um and you know their best strongest material the willie sets are going to be short i mean i don't know the full length yet but probably in the you know usually in the 75 ish minute range something like that you know 90 if you're lucky 60 if you're unlucky uh uh you know 
so it's gonna be kind of like a first set or one set, you know one set but you know uh, as, as hard as bobby's been working this year he loves willie nelson and you know i think he took that as much just to be around willie you know there's got to um, be collabs on the horizon i'm right? sure there'll be collabs on, I, I mean i know what i want to ask bobby and willie to do for my 50th birthday present but we'll see if either <laughs> can go for will, it will bobby get on the bus will bobby um, get on willie's bus because we know what happens on willie's bus bobby and i both got on willie's bus at his 90th um um these so days, not though. as much as, uh, you know, I had to wear a mask so that you know, <laughs> there, there wasn't any joint sharing going on. Um, and I think he's more edibles these days anyway, like like uh, most guys are that age. But, uh, um, you know, it was awesome being on Willie's bus, I got to say. Good question, um, Tyler. When are Cowie shows? That's my question, too. When he, when, when uh, well, we'll have uh, uh, Bobby with the Stanford Symphony Orchestra at the Frost in, uh, I guess that's late October. We are in talks with Oakland Symphony about something early next year. Um, and I'm sure next summer we'll expect uh, some kind of Wolf Bros at either the Greek again, like we did 21 or, or, or the Frost like last year. You know, they'll be, they'll, be, they'll be that. And I'm sure we'll get back to, you know, we did L.A. in October, the Greek. I'm sure we'll get back to L.A. Greek, maybe Santa Barbara County Bowl. 24 but will it's be a never big be Wolf like Bros a, year. It's nice. never going to be a rat dog kind of touring schedule with Wolf Brothers. I mean, no, I mean, it's, it's, I, I think next year, the, the front part of the year is one offs and cool things. I think it's a big summer tour. I mean, I know he's Finish anxious, that album. Or? Yeah, he's anxious to do Newport Folk Festival. Um, you know, so I could see a long summer that feels a little bit like this summer's dead and company type of deal. You know, I mean, we're still leasing this bus year round, so it's going to get used. Um, you know, and so, uh, um, you know, I expect, I expect a lot of Wolf Bros shows next year. Uh, I, you know, I don't know how far. Like I said, I think it'll be centered around the summer and, and what we can do. And then, uh, and you know, in the symphony shows, symphony shows have to kind of be anchors because they're less flexible with their schedule. So are, I think it's we, first we'll lock in things like that. Are we ever going to get to see a trio again? Um, Bobby with a bass and drums, Jay and uh, you know, somebody. He, it's, it's interesting because the Guild shows, the five show run we just did, the Guild in April was supposed to be trio. And then he sort of, round them out with guests uh, you know trio's hard for him um it, it's it's a lot of he's got a lot to cover as a rhythm guitar player this is the only melodic instrument being a rhythm guitarist and so so, so many years with him it's a and challenge what, what i think you're going to see more of is how we do with the wolf bros where like some nights we break it down like some nights we start sets one three five seven ten you know where it's first he does a solo song then the trio then just jeff and barry round them out then maybe we just add the strings or just add the horns and then we're in 10 piece land. I, I think you're going to see more mixing up with the Wolf Bros formula than maybe just like, okay, now I'm going to do some trio shows because it's, it's hard it, for him. It's, uh, I think he thought he could just switch that quickly, but you know, again, he's got, he got the five piece string and horns, Barry and Jeff to help him add color. And then suddenly it's all on him. And, and, mm. and, you know, I, I just always thought the Weir and Wasserman was so powerful. Yeah. With just him up there. Yeah. And he carried it well. Yeah, I think I, he at the end of the day, he's got to practice that again. You know, it's like, but like, you know, I mean, I because I, he never did solo acoustic until I started managing him and I started pushing him to to try it. And, he, you know, he, he's a rhythm, he's an electric rhythm guitar player. You just can't play the same thing on acoustic guitar and sing Stella Blue that way. Right. You, know, you got it. He's got to relearn Stella Blue from right. scratch to play it solo acoustic. So each song has to be relearned one at a time. And he's not going to go on tour with 20 songs done. You know, if he's going to go on tour, or do shows he's going to want to mix it up like he's used to mixing it up you know mm -hmm. and so that's a lot of homework um <laughs> there a you lot go. of homework there you go. <laughs> that's crazy wow oh. we're approaching 11 o'clock what do you think t <laughs> oh wow. you guys are east coasters see i'm approaching uh, i'm on the <laughs> west i'm with you i'm on my head right, so, yeah. so, so if we want to go recap. let's go there, there are right. other questions there are other uh, questions if people on board me i'll keep to... taking questions yeah all right I would throw this at you because I really want to know, and it might be too difficult to even get into, but. Um, a 45 minute war, uh, war frat. Well, so, no, I'm about to say my perfect drum, my perfect end of show is drum space. Other one, war frat, throwing stones, not fade away. Um, which I got. To other catch one, except for I used to write on tapes. I got to write, I got to write, <laughs> I got to catch a couple of times. Um, I mean, Cornell, I think was my perfect dead and company set list, um, for that band. Um, again, you know, like I treat each configuration, like something different. So, um, you know, my perfect grateful dead set list would have other one, Warfare, throwing stones, not fade away, 
probably an estimated eyes. Um, I mean, if it was 91 plus Grateful Dead, it would definitely have a Ruben and Charisse. Um, you know, maybe I should write settlers for J Red someday because they could do all those. Songs. <laughs> oh, you ever have them on here? Ask them if they want to guess settlers right or something. <laughs> right. Uh, that's a good question. Why new lazy lightning ever? I've always Bobby uh, won't. So he, when he says things like, I got to rewrite the lyrics, which is what he says every time someone brings up lazy lightning, I take that as okay, he's done with that song. Um, there's two things he often says. Which is one is I got to rewrite the lyrics, which to me means he can't sing how it currently is, and so he won't, and and so he just won't. Um, though it does supplication with the Wolf Bros, just not the Lazy mm. Lightning part of it. And some people get get all excited; they hear the My Lightning two parts and that refrain, and like holy shit. Um, but it, it doesn't go all the way there. And uh, then the other thing, which uh, he said the last time I brought up a Promised Land, was uh, I've done all that I can do with that song. It's just got there's no other there's nothing different else different for me to do with it. And so sometimes that hits a song, which is, you know, it's some of his like, I mean, he's done Dark Hollow again lately, but like some of those sort of simple acoustic songs like That Monkey and the Engineer on the Road Again. I brought those up recently. He said, ask me again in a couple of years. <laughs> what about what about Brother East, Paul? Is that Brother East, so he used to say that all the time. I need to change the lyrics. I need to change the lyrics. And then as far as I can tell, him and Barlow changed one line. From the year 1969 to the year 2009, and now he does again. Now it's regular Wolf Bros rotation. Right. What, um, a, what about um, in the 90s? In fact, it's, it's, I, I love to I love to open uh, I love to open shows with Brother East. So I just come out with bang. bang. Yeah. What What about <laughs> um? What do you know? Victim. Well, he does with Wolf Bros again now. That just came back around his birthday in the fall for the first time in a while. Um, how come we only got one uh, one masterpiece? I, I used to always that was kind of I always felt like his song that he did more of anyway and then you only of all the dylan tunes yeah yeah i you know i've been having the same problem with the dylan tunes i was having with tunes like loser rogue jimmy i i I kept you know it sort of falls in the slow song spot and i kept ending up somewhere else and then before when we left boulder at one point bobby said i want to get a a a masterpiece out before we're out of here and so i i threw it on that on night one of the gorge um i loved it yeah and uh i I, I, you know again i had queen jane in my love queen jane but i just i just you know again sometimes it comes down yeah again this being last tour i always err towards does the crowd want does the majority of the crowd want that queen jane out of nowhere or do they want one more ramble on rose Mm -hmm. and and, I, and, uh, and whereas in tours past, I would def- I would always go to the Queen Jane because right. that's where my heart is, is indifferent. Yeah. Um, you know, I am at every show and every rehearsal. So right. believe me, I want to hear different, too. <laughs> um, but uh, I would this this tour, like I said, throughout the whole system and went a little more on feel. And uh, yeah, like Hard Rain never got out this this tour. It'll come out right. with Wolf Rose again. He does that regularly with the Wolf Rose. Right. But uh, Tom, um, uh, it might be a toss up with that, Tom. <laughs> I don't. Know. <laughs> You're not a fan of Queen Jane, Jane, I guess, Kevin. That's too. No, funny. well, my mom's named Jane, and it's the last ah. thing I want to hear at a show when I'm all wasted is about Understood. something that makes me think of my mother. <laughs> That's fair. Why so, aren't you taking your mom to the show? Bobby yeah. also does a killer. She belongs to me with uh, Wolf Rose too. Um, um, what do you know about when Black Throated Wind came back with the Grateful Dead? It had d- a completely. Different he had whole new lyrics. lyrics, and then he threw them out. Yeah, I mean, I, I. I I think I saw one of those in 91 um, around the time I saw the Ruben Charisse and Loose Lucy. Uh, but I, and I never straight up asked him about it. So I, don't yeah, really so I always found it strange because I was at the show. He broke it out at Cap Center and we, I was trying oh, to sing yeah. along and I didn't know the lyrics anymore. You didn't know any of the lyrics. But you're right, you're there. Yeah. So, well, you know, we did invite Dylan to uh, the last shows, but we're still waiting on an answer. Um what, what do you think about him covering those Dylan songs? He did. We love it. I mean, Bobby's on. Bobby's on. He did only a river of Bobby's yeah. Blue Mountain album, and not only did he do it, like he rearranged it. He learned it and practiced it and arranged it, and Bobby was stunned. I mean, it just it wow. blew him away. And uh, I've pitched a really insane idea to Dylan's manager for a, a Bobby Dylan collab for whenever it could be one or two shows. It's completely insane idea in fact i said to him it's so insane i think your guy might actually go for it because it's not what you'd expect and he goes i actually he actually liked it enough to take it to him someday i don't know if it's happening or not right i um um um, but we'll see you know i I, i'll you know with with dylan you never get your hopes up because i worked at this place called painter's mill years ago and owings mills it's burned down now but they used to have bands and i worked there as a load-in guy and um dylan played once 
and they had a staff meeting beforehand and they told us nobody make eye contact with Bob Dylan. They were like, do not make eye contact with him. We were all like, that's cool. All I'm doing is pushing boxes on the stage. Yeah, I don't remember. I mean, I, you know, we did Phil Dylan tours in, in 2000, 2000, and then he was like on 03. I don't remember vibes like Anything that. Anything like that, yeah. Who I mean, made? there was some weird stuff. I, 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 I do remember... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I do remember a, uh, I think it was down by you actually. No, it was uh, State College. That was a 2000. good show. State College 2000, Dylan and yeah. Phil and Friends. And I went a, on that tour for a little bit. A particularly new member of, uh, I did too. Uh, I was working for Warren Haynes. Uh, a, a member of Phil's band was in the wrong hallway at the wrong time. And apparently Dylan himself said, who the fuck are all these people in my hallway? Sorry, guys. So, so now so, again, Dylan also ask- later that tour was out doing a walkabout in his disguise, and the same band member and two others were completely fooled because he went right up to them, "Hey guys," and was all giving hugs and happy and welcoming and shooting the shit for you know like like it was you know like they're all old buddies, even though you know a day before. <laughs> right. Different do, attitude. Do you- he's just you know I think he's just he just entertains himself. He just right. does what he do- does to make himself laugh um why was um why was there never more of a focus on any brent tunes having someone sing them i think is really what it came down to we talked about you know we certainly talked about tons of steel and uh little light maybe would have been fun yeah little light i mean like you know warren does that so well we didn't really have the voice for that um jeff didn't really want to sing them I tried so hard to get Jeff to take a song. Uh, you know, I actually actually have videos of him trying to work up Alligator and sing it. Um, and then at some point he's like, I just, I, I ain't, you know, just, he, he kind of backed out of it. Um, you know, I tried, tried to get him to do it, but he, he you know, t- he took the lines, you know, that the, right that we begged him to do in good times. Going down the road. Going down the road and the, the wait. Um, wait, yeah. But uh, he, uh, yeah, he, he's, he's too not busy really over there, kind of leading the band, you know. To he's like not really itching like... to sing, um, yeah. you know, and so it just uh, he likes yeah, doing just, what he's doing. You know, I, that I became talk... that became you know, fantasy Jude is what that became. That became the Brent. Right. The Brent. I, I talked to a band um, earlier. That was the one song called... that like all six guys could go. Yeah, right. we could. I could get behind that one. You know, right. I talked so, to a band earlier today uh, called yeah, Surprise you know, Jake, Chef. Jake probably right. Bet Mayo would have crushed Never Trust a Woman. That's that. Yeah, you know. If he would ever gone to learning learning it, I bet he would have. Uh, I bet he would have. Right. Yeah, hey, Pocket, yeah. Hey, Pocket, yeah. Hey, Pocket Way could have been cool, but, but um, that one I think is still too too much of a cover to those guys, and I don't know that the band guys associate that with Brent enough. That would I love that tune I caught one at uh, Nassau '90 that would just blew me away. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, but yeah, I, I think I think to them that's still covering a meter song. Um, I don't think right. they, they feel enough ownership over that as a dead tune, even with Brent doing it. I hear you. I mean, obviously yeah, like I straight point. up heard Jeff. I think it was Jeff play, you know, give me some loving chords and something multiple times. And then he straight up. Yeah. Yeah. That's what that is. But, but would never push for the song to come out. What, um, what song had the Booker T and Oh, us blues. They go into green onions or something. Yeah. yeah us yeah. blues. Yep. I kept telling T that and he's like, I missed it again, man. I wasn't missing it again. And then I finally heard <laughs> it. Then I, yeah. You didn't pay attention to it enough. And then I finally heard it. And I was like, Kev, you're right. Yeah. There it is. And then you can't miss it. Like once you hear it once, <laughs> you it's don't like you hear it every it. time. But yeah, yep. there's a few of those that they changed up a little bit like that. That were really cool to yep. see. Like, they they really seem to own it more this tour. Like yeah. It, yeah. it felt like instead of them being playing Grateful Dead songs, they were the Grateful Dead songs. Yeah, exactly. That it, felt, it really did feel like that this tour. It was fantastic, fantastic. All right, it was really it's great. eleven o'clock. I have one um, last question for you. We'll yeah, you got it. from one of your friends here. You got it. <laughs> Let's see. What, what am I looking at here? Oh, the bottom of the screen. What's your favorite <laughs> color? <laughs> I'm always in black. You know this, Katie. <laughs> I'm always in black. That is the look. Oh, Sometimes Matt, we I'm can't not think- on the road. I'm not in black, but but I'm almost always in black. Yes, yeah, thank Bob, you Bobby, Bobby uh, rhyming orange with door hinge. Oh, in Heiko. Um, yes. Uh, uh, what is the the full line? I almost well, I'll probably blush if I actually have to sing it. Um, but I think it's see that girl all dressed in orange. I go, I go all day. 
Bekshishi squeaks like a rusty old door hinge. Jacques yeah. I believe that's the orange rhymes with door yeah, hinge. You did that wine. on Pride. You did that for um, Pride Day or Pride Month. Oh, he's been something. doing that for a few years now. I've been doing that since right. further. But um, we we all said, hey, we're, we're doing that for Pride Day. Look at them. They're on top of it. <laughs> what, what was that question? That was... That, was that a good creative, well, I cannot take credit for that because that wasn't, uh, right. unfortunately. Uh, what was that question you had, T? Does Bobby oh, ever no, talk no. about uh, Mind Left Body Jam? Oh, right here. I know they don't call it that, but do you know what that piece of music they refer to is? Um, I mean, I, I know what you're I don't know what it actually is. No, I would have to ask him. Right. That yeah, is, everyone says it's from a, a Paul Cantner album. But if you listen to and, Yes, I think Your Mind Has on, Left Your Body, I think, is, is actually yeah. what that song is called. But it doesn't sound anything um, like it. I don't know. Oh, really? <laughs> it, I think it has to do with the. I think it has to do with the Planet Earth Rock and Roll Orchestra thing. It's um, something that came out of oh, that. Oh, could be. Yeah, it could be. I thought he so, was playing it at some points on the store. He had it out in rehearsals. I know that. I don't. I never saw him. Did I didn't he not really come out with it. it? No. Interesting. Yeah, I, 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 I don't have an answer for that. Yeah, he, he had that Paul Reed Smith that looks like it was siding mm. the way the wood was and the paint on it. It was fantastic sounding, but it looked weird. Yeah, to look at. yeah. yeah, no, I, mean, I guess he didn't really end up with the replica much. Um, interesting, yeah. Yeah, it was kind of weird. He really he shredded on what he used, though. I gotta um, tell you, like, it was really fun to watch. Fortunately, Lemieux lives really far from me, so I don't hang out with him all that much. He's in like Canada, um, and I'm in San there Diego. Um, I'm just scrolling these chat questions now. <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, brand of supplement. Um, <laughs> now we're just uh, just scrolling here. Make sure. yeah, no, I'll, <laughs> I'll leave anyone wanting more. If there's any good ones in there, that's good. So, yeah. oh yeah, Matt, we well, can't thank you enough, man. This was this was so incredible. Like, this yeah. is a lot yeah, of fun. Yeah, it's fun. Love chatting with you guys. Bobby, I mean, Bob, Bobby has always had successful collaborations with other people, but he doesn't seem to embrace it as much as he could. Do you think that? Bobby doesn't brace collaborations as much. But like, like showing up. I mean, he's done them more this year. He showed up at the thing with Dave Matthews earlier. Oh, right. You know, but, but he, there was a long time where Bob Weir was grateful to Ed. If he showed up and did something well, different, it was him and Jerry playing or something. You well, know? I, I'll just say it this. It's July 20th. Um, this is my 36th day home this year. This tour was two and a half months long. We'd already done a two-month tour. Right. Uh, I think he's just been too goddamn busy to do the usual uh Parading right. around town is the special sitting guest that he's used to doing. Um, right, right. I think right now it just kind of comes to that. I mean, now that that you know we're gonna shut down for a while, he may start popping around uh, Sweetwater or wherever while he's home right. for a little bit here. But we've just been grinding so hard. I mean, this goes back to last year. Even we did a fall tour right into recording in Nashville for three weeks, and and then right into Mexico, and then that went into two, two month tour. And you know, we've just been severely overbooked. Yeah, cool. Sure. I think that's what. It Cool, very good. Um, I, are you gonna run us out, T? Since our, our producer left halfway through the show, so that's why. <laughs> Since there's no one to take us off air. <laughs> it, it was actually. Let, let, let me send a shout out. It was Llama's yeah. birthday today, so happy birthday, Llama! Oh, happy we birthday, Llama! Then he can go yeah. to his party. Um, He's right. the man behind oh, the scenes. I would love to get Bobby to collaborate with King Gizzard. I, I saw them at the Salt Shed, and I had the had a great time seeing them. Um, Probably wouldn't work out on some of their uh, uh, mosh pit music, but maybe on some of the other stuff it would be cool. Uh, <laughs> no, you can't and yourself. yes, Matt's Why? planning on fish at Dick's at the end of uh, the summer like last year, so uh, nice. hopefully that will hold. Yes, and hopefully when you come into town in September, we can uh, grab a beer or something hang out for Yeah, a definitely. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, hang out for a little bit backstage with us, Matt, before you leave. We'll talk for a minute yeah. before you leave, but thank yeah. you, everybody. Yeah, like, thanks, subscribe. Everyone. We'll do it again Become soon. Become a fan. Then August 3rd, uh, we got Taper's Choice. Same kind of interview. We'll do a live interview with them. Yep. And uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody. This was fun.